Okay, Chair, we're now live on YouTube. When you're ready, would you like to start the meeting? Thank you, Wendy. Good morning and welcome to East Devon District Council's Virtual Planning Committee on 4th of August 2021. I'm your Chair, Councillor mm. Eileen Rag, and I would also like to welcome anyone watching the meeting via the live streaming. I would also like to welcome Councillor Colin Brown and Councillor Chris Wright, I don't think is here because he hasn't had the training yet. Um, so welcome Colin Brown back to the committee and to say thank you to Councillor Tom Wright, who's left the committee to become Chair of Scrutiny and to thank him for his helpful contributions. Following the extraordinary general meeting of Council on 26th of July this year, <clears throat> I would like to remind members and any members of the public attending or watching that the council has de delegated much of the decision taking to senior officers for a short period of time due to concerns around COVID. Consequently, this will be a consultative meeting only. We will adhere as much as possible to the procedural rules detailed in the constitution. Accordingly, where the meeting would have normally decided a matter, this will now be a recommendation of the committee to the senior officer who's taken the decision so that they may have regard to the views expressed when taking the decision. Where the meeting is making onward recommendations to council, cabinet or another committee, for example, this will happen in the normal way. All participants here today are taking part remotely and as well as being live streamed, the meeting is being recorded. So please bear this in mind throughout. May I remind you to be careful with your language. <clears throat> May I also remind members that the code of conduct applies throughout this meeting. And we also reserve the right to remove and disconnect any participant who's disrupting the meeting by whatever means. In the event of a break in the internet connection or a power cap, please bear with us as we try to reconnect. After 15 minutes, if we are not able to reconnect, we will consider the meeting adjourned and reconvene at a later date. Please check the committee page on our website for details. <clears throat> Members, please make sure that your phones are on silent or your mic microphones are muted when you're not speaking to avoid any background noise levels. Keep points short and do not repeat points that have already made and do not interrupt. If you wish to comment, please raise your electronic hand and wait to be called. All councillors have been sent the agenda for today's meeting. Any members of the public who want to view the agenda can do so by visiting our website www.eastdevon.gov.uk. We will now start the meeting by doing a roll call of committee members here present. Can you please now unmute your microphone and when you hear your name, please confirm by saying present. When you have confirmed your present, please mute your microphone again. So Wendy, could you do the roll call please? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So I'll start with you, Councillor Rag. <coughs> Present. Thank you. Councillor Chamberlain. Present. Thank you. Councillor Bloxham. Present. Councillor Brown. Present. Councillor Davy. Present. Councillor Desaran. Present. Thank you, Wendy. Councillor Gazard. Present. Thank you. We've received apologies from Councillor Howe. So, Councillor Key? Present. Councillor Lawrence? Present, Wendy. Thank you. Councillor Pook? Present. Councillor Pratt? Present. Thank you. Councillor Skinner? Present. Councillor Wibley? Councillor Woodward? Present. Thank you. And we've received apologies from Councillor Wright. Back to you, Chair. Thank you, Wendy. 
Right, the running order for today's meeting and the speakers list can be viewed under I agenda item one on pages four to five. Agenda item two, minutes of the previous meeting held on 15th of July, 2021, pages six to nine. If anyone has a comment on these minutes, please raise your electronic hand. If there are no raised hands, I will take it as an indication that you are happy to recommend the minutes for approval. Uh, there is one raised hand, Colin Brown. Yeah, can That's we approve right. these? Can we approve these minutes? Because we're not the planning committee, we're a consultative committee. So I don't see how we can approve the minutes for a meeting that we're not in. Over to um, Shirley or Anita, please. I, I can I can confirm that um, if you are going to approve the minutes, you will be recommending to the um, decision maker, the senior officer, to approve the minutes. <coughs> Thank you. So are we recommending approval of the minutes, please? I see no raised hands, so I take that as a um, recommendation for approval of the minutes. Thank you. Gender item three, apologies. Um, Wendy? Yes, we've received two apologies, Councillor Chris Wright and Councillor Howe. Thank you. Uh, agenda item four, Declarations of interest. Um, I I have one. Um, that is the item for twenty one 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 three two four. Sigma Sigford. I had a um, an email yesterday from an objector. Object. Thank you. Right, so members, um, when I call your name, if you could just confirm the item number, what type of interest it is, and um, why you're declaring that interest. So uh, thank you, Chair. So I'll move on to uh, Councillor Chamberlain. Thank you, Wendy. Um, yes, item number eight and item number 15, I've received emails on both of them. Emails from um, the objectors or Oh, agents? sorry. Item number 15 was the agent and uh, item number eight was the applicant. Thank you. And that's a personal interest. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bloxham. Yes, thank you, Wendy. I also received emails from various representatives, including agents and objectors for agenda item 9, 11 and 14. So it's a personal interest. Uh, excuse me, members, is that uh, you're saying these are personal interests, but are, is it considered to be more lobbying than a personal interest? Sorry, thank you. Yes, I would use the word lobbying rather than personal interest. Thank you very much, Councillor. Mrs. Shaw, lobbying? I would say the same as well. OK, thank you. Councillor. All the app oh, sorry to interrupt. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so is that for lobbying for all the applications? So, so Councillor Chamberlain, so uh, uh, items 8 and 15, you would consider that lobbying? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And then Councillor Bloxham, items 9, 11 and 14, they are all lobbying too? Yes, they are. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Brown. I feel like I've missed out, but then people probably don't realise I'm back on committee. So you have none. Thank you. That's right. <laughs> Councillor Davy. Thank you. Yeah, I'm a bit confused because I don't have an item 15 on my agenda. No, so I, um, I don't know if I'm looking at an old agenda. Um, Anyway, I, I'll state the application numbers. Uh, for 21-1132 FUL, I've had a copy of the objection um, from Mr. Brecken. 21-1058 um, FUL, um, I've had a copy of... Um, uh, sorry, Mr. Brecken's representation. The previous one was a copy of the objection. 
so those are both um, lobbying and in respect of um, item 11 210857 I'm an Exmouth town councillor and actually live very close to the property in question Thank you. Um, Sorry, so that's two lobbying and one personal. Yes, I've got that. Thank you, Councillor Davy. Uh, so going back to Councillor Chamberlain's um, declaration, um, so when you say item 15, it's correct, we, we don't have item 15. Are you saying it's item 14? Application number 21 forward slash 1132, Sidmouth. Yep, I, that's item 14. Lovely. Thank you very much. So um, next is Councillor Dasaram. Good morning, Wendy. Um, uh, yes, I, I will declare that I am Exmouth Town Councillor. It is not my ward. I declare that in respect of item 21 slash 057. Um, I've also received the letter from Demelza Tucker um, in respect to that item. So that, that is one. I've also been lobbied under item nine. Uh, the 21-1058 fool. Um, I received that the, the applicant. So that's another one that I've been lobbied on. Um, I have received a lobbying from Councillor Rickson under 21-1132 full item 14. So I have no interest to declare, but I, I've been lobbied on all three of them. And I've also received an email, but they didn't actually specify what the application was for, from a Mrs. Janet Weber. It was an objection, but I'm not sure which, which, which particular issue my, uh, case it might relate to, because they didn't actually put in a reference. But I, I just mentioned it, uh, should we come upon it at some point during the course of this meeting. So that, that's all that I have to say on the matter. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Wendy. Yeah, thank that, you, that that final one, Wendy, would refer to 211132. Uh, thank you so much, Chair. Okay. Chair. Chair, sorry to interrupt. Could we please, members, switch up to mute when we're not speaking? Because during that last declaration, there was a lot of uh, interference. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, Sir Councillor Gazard. Yes, Wendy, uh, lobbied on number nine number 11 and number 14 and for number 11 I am an Exmouth Town Councillor. Thank you. Councillor Key. <coughs> yes Wendy, uh, lobbied on 9 and 14 and ward member for number 10. Thank you. Councillor Lawrence. Okay. Thank you Wendy. Um, I was lobbied on Item 11, 21 slash 0587. No other interest. Thank Lovely, thank you. Councillor Pook. Uh, thank you. Lobby 9, 11, 14, and a personal um, but not pecuniary interest in um, 21 1420, as I was the previous owner of the site before it was developed. Thank you, Councillor Pook. Councillor Pratt. Yes, uh, lobbied on item nine and item 14. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Skinner. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, lobbied on item nine, 1058. Um, lobbied on 11, 0587, of which I have uh, I think I'm going to declare a personal interest and would ask to be removed from the meeting uh, as I do not want to speak or vote. And on item 14, I have 11.32, I have also been lobbied on that one as well. Thank you, Councillor Skinner. Sorry, Wendy, do before we you go further... Councillor Skinner, could you please indicate what the nature of your personal interest is in item 11? Uh, I received uh, an email uh, from the gentleman, which was uh, quite a, uh, shall we say, um, how shall I put it? I, I did bring Henry, actually, but couldn't get hold of him. Uh, tried, tried a verotic email from the applicant at one point. So on that basis, 
I would prefer to um, remove myself from this particular agenda item, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have Councillor Wibley in the meeting? I'm just checking. No, we don't. OK, so and finally, uh, Councillor Woodward. Thank you, Wendy. Yes, I've been lobbied in respect of item 9, 11 and 14. And I'm also the ward member for number 11 in Hullam for Exmouth Holson. Thank you very much. Back to you, Chair. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, right, agenda item five, matters of urgency. There are no matters of urgency to discuss. Uh, six, confidential items. There are no confidential items to discuss. Uh, item seven, appeal status report 2020 to 2021, pages 10 to 14. Over to Mr Rose for the update, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Morning, everybody. Yeah, so uh, as the Chair said, this is the annual report that we bring updating you on the previous year's performance uh, in relation to appeals. So it runs from April 2020 to the end of March this year. And you'll see the recommendation is, is for members to note report. And you'll see in it there were 44 appeal decisions over that, uh, that year period, of which 14 were allowed. So that's uh, just over a 68% success rate. And members may be aware that we've got a, a target of 70%. So we fell just short of that, lower than our performance last year, which was 75% and just lower than the national average. Um, of those, there was one informal hearing and the other 43 appeals were done by uh, written reps. Uh, of the 14 that were allowed, five of them related uh, to committee items, four of them were overturns, and one of them weren't with officer recommendation. Um, now, one of the, the, the key points of the report really is to uh, see if there are any trends or any lessons that we can learn from the appeals. Um, I think the, the, the main one in there is just the continuing difficulty of being able to uh, win appeals for householder extensions. You'll see that we only had a 50% success rate on those. Um, it, it's really just continuing that, that trend that the impact on the neighbour from a house extension really has to be quite severely harmful for us to be able to uh, uphold a, um, a refusal on appeal. There are no other trends, uh, although... Um, it, it's probably quite unusual that we had uh, five out of the 14 that, that went to committee. But uh, saying that, um, if we'd have had one of those 14 appeal decisions the other way, then we would have hit the 70 percent target. So we, we weren't very far off of that. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing to report is that there were six applications for costs uh, against us, of which none of those were allowed. So that's good. Um, so, yeah, so it's really for members to note the report and performance and in particular note the difficulty of uh, the continuing difficulty in upholding refusals on appeal of house extensions unless the, uh, the impact on the neighbour or, or the visual impact is, is very harmful. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chris. <clears throat> right. Thank you. Um, agenda item eight, planning. Oh, no, wait a minute. Planning appeals statistics. 15 to 24. So back to you again. Yeah, so this, thank you, Chair. So these are the uh, the appeals that we've had since the last committee. Um, you'll see there are there are five appeals that have been dis determined and happy to say that all of those five appeals were dismissed. Good. Thank you. Good news, thank you. Um, right, item nine, application number 21, 1058, full, Rose Farm, is it weak or wike? Right. Axminster. Right. right. Page 25 to 42. Thank you. Um, and there's a statement to be read by Catherine Whitaker. And welcome to the meeting, uh, Alan Brecken. Um, Thank, you. Thank you, Madam. Right. Over to you, uh, Mr. Rose, to present your report, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, hopefully you can you can see my screen. So we've got an application here for construction of an open fronted general storage barn. Um, oh, sorry, let me get rid of that. Uh, and there's ward member support, which is why the application is before you. 
Um, it's for a mix of uses, really. Some are agricultural, uh, some are question and for storage use. And it's in the countryside, uh, outside of the AOMB, but there are uh, listed buildings in very close proximity to the site. And members may recall that we had a similar application before you in January at that committee. It was for a slightly shorter but taller building. And that was refused due to its large scale and its location, fell into preserve the rural setting and being harmful to the two uh, listed buildings. Uh, it was also stated there was no uh, agricultural need uh, and therefore no uh, public benefits that outweighed the harm to those listed buildings. So this is the, the site here. It'll make more sense with the photos for those that, that don't recall it from January. We've got the main farmhouse here, number of outbuildings. And then this here is the location for the, the barn and the, the road runs down here and around. And we have a further listed building on the other side of the road uh, down here. Um, so as we go along, so this is the site cut into the uh, cut into the bank ever so slightly, and you can see the elevations of, of the building there. So lower at the back, raising up to a, a, a small pitch uh, at the front of the building. Um, and this, so this is the layout. So again, proposed over there, uh, the proposed barn, and we've got existing barns and sheds, and then we get to the main house, uh, and then we've got the other listed building on the. The other side and these are the elevations of the previous scheme that came forward so you can see taller building uh, about half a meter taller than what we've got proposed now uh, but about half a meter narrow uh, less long um, the holding extends to about 23 acres as you can see uh, on this plan here uh, and in terms of the visual impact so this is the road coming down the sites on here to the right so you would view the building off here to the right and you can see uh, their JCB and then we come down so we've got the main cottage to the left and the agricultural building will be in the distance there behind behind that tree and we've got a further list of building off to the to the right and within the site there's various stores that you can see uh, uh, some in equestrian use some storage for uh, other um, machinery and vehicles as you can see there uh, and other trailers and stuff on the site although I believe this one might have been might have been sold uh, so this is a sort of image from the street. So the barn will go in here above the fence uh, behind that, that bit of bush there. And as you move along, so the sites to the right, one of the listed buildings, and then you can see the other listed building on the other side of the road. Um, so as I say, this is a different design. It's lowered in height from the previous building, although ever so slightly longer, but probably not really that noticeable to the eye. And you'll see in the report uh, mention of two policies. So D7, um, which allows agricultural buildings where there's a general agricultural need and there's no visual or other harm. And also policy RC4 that relates to outdoor recreation facilities to so cover in the um, equestrian part of the proposal. Um, but whilst there's 23 acres uh, to the holding, uh, it appears to be in pasture use. Uh, there's no information or evidence provided of any livestock on the holding or, or any wider agricultural use, only uh, production of the haylage. Um, and the, the equestrian use appears to be small scale and personal. Um, so given the small holding, uh, lack of information uh, in terms of the farming holding, uh, the small equestrian use, and there being a number of existing buildings on the site, uh, it's difficult to understand why all of the equipment and the store is needed in this si uh, size of building. Uh, you saw a photo of a JCB. I, we understand that's for ditch clearance and tree planting, but that, that's not related to work on the site. Uh, or not solely related to work on the site, uh, I shouldn't think. Um, and there's other equipment there, but as you can see, some of that's in existing buildings. So uh, in terms of the, the application, the barns uh, therefore considered to be larger than needed, even if some of the existing buildings are, are proposed to be freed up to create parking for the main house. Um, and uh, there's mention of haylage in there in terms of needing uh, the building for that, but there's an existing store, other store on the site for haylage, so it's unclear of the need or capacity or the space that's required for that. Uh, so there's buildings uh, present uh, that store some of these items, and um, we haven't really found any, any justification for the scale of the building that's proposed. And uh, that's key in this instance because of the, the visual impact. Although the building will be partly screened by this, by this fence, the upper part of the buildings will be visible and it's uh, because the potential to harm the setting of these two listed buildings, uh, given its size and given the lack of justification. 
and there's no wider public benefits. The, the benefits to the proposal are, are all to do with the, the applicant's personal benefits. So no wider benefits that would outweigh the harm from the visual impact on these two listed buildings. So on the basis of the information submitted across this application and the previous one, uh, there's not considered to be a general agricultural need uh, and we question uh, the equestrian need for a building of this scale and size. Uh, so despite its smaller scale from the previous application, uh, it's still considered to have a harmful visual impact on the setting of these listed buildings to which members will be aware you have to give great weight uh, with no public benefit. So therefore, as before, the application is recommended for refusal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we have an objector um, not present, I think, um, that is Denise Birch. Uh, do you have something to read out on her behalf, Wendy? Yes, yes, I do. Yes, Thank Chair. you. Okay, so the following uh, short statement is from Mr. Dennis Birch, and he says, my, object my objections and views have not changed since my first communication. It would be better suited to a more unobtrusive commercial location site near Bye. I would like to thank Mrs. Green, Chris Harrodays, also the rest of the team for all their efforts in this matter. I sincerely hope these recommendations in letter dated 9th of July 2021 will be put into practice. We would like WIKE to keep its uniqueness. End of statement. Thank you, Wendy. And you have another one from Catherine Whitaker. Yes, I do, Chair. So, uh, the, yeah, the following statement is from Mrs. Catherine Whitaker. Um, she uh, states, Chair and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to contribute. The previous application re was resolutely refused on the basis of its harmful effects on the setting of grade two listed buildings, supplementary to which was lack of justification for the building. Regarding damage to the setting of the two listed cottages, case law, notably Forge Field Society versus Seven Oaks District Council and Barnwell Manor versus East Hamptonshire District Council, reinforces the considerable importance and weight which might be given to preserving the setting of listed buildings. The current application is now 500 millimetres lower than previous, a reduction of less than 10%. It is wider than previous. We consider this application presents merely cosmetic changes to what has recently been refused and therefore, and therefore, and therefore sorry, assume it would be consistent to also refuse this application. And so, ancillary to this and regarding need, committee comment was made previously that a much smaller building would be necessary to manage a holding of this type and size. Considering existing storage buildings on the holding at Rose Cottage and Farm, our view is that a development of this size is not necessary to manage this holding. The applicants already the applicants claim already to provide public benefit. The NPPF states that public benefits flow from the development itself and therefore we suggest that this development is super, 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 oh sorry I can't get my words, superfluous. <laughs> Services provided for friends but not offered for to the whole community are in effect contracting services, whether or not payment is involved. It is for individual land landowners in Wyke to maintain their hedges and how they do this is a matter for them. A supporter comments that the site is an eyesore. Perhaps a solution to this might be the storage of the applicant's equipment at their off-site premises rather than in this tiny historic hamlet. We thank the appointed officers for concluding that there is insufficient justification for a building of this size and scale, that the public benefit definitions have not been met and for maintaining a substantial objection to the damage that this development would have on the 
setting of the Grade 2 listed cottages in line with Section 66 of the Planning Listed Buildings and Conservation Areas Act 1990 on the basis that the the building was resolutely refused previously and that the size and scale of... I've just, just got a small sentence... Um, and that the size and scale of the building has not changed materially. We hope that we hope for a consistent conclusion to today's proceedings. End of statement. Thank, thank you, Wendy. <clears throat> right now, uh, we have the agent, Alan Brecken. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Can you hear thank me? You. Yes, we can. Three minutes. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, members who have just been advised that the January meet, January meet in the building was described by the planners as an agricultural building, but before the discussion took place, they were advised and appeared to accept that it was actually a general purpose building for the storage of the applicant's various machinery, equipment, vehicles and haylage, most of which is presently kept out in the open. During the recorded discussion, most members that spoke expressed sympathy with the use of the building, but shared the concerns about its scale and relationship to Rose, Rose Farm a listed building outside the curtage of the site. The application was refused, but with a clear indication, led, I believe, by Councillor Skinner and Howe, that the applicant should take advantage of their free go and look at reducing its height and amending its design to be more in keeping with other buildings on the site. A wooden frame building was suggested. The applicants listened to what was said, and the building before you now is representative of what those members who supported the principle were looking for. It's an open-fronted general storage timber barn of the minimum size to accommodate the largest piece of machinery, uh, the JCB particularly, and designed to reflect its surroundings. Without this building, equipment at Haylage would remain stored outside. The height of the building when first submitted was six metres. It has been cut into the lower bank. It's 3.9 metres high to the front overhang, rising to a five metre maximum height and sloping down to 3.4 metres at the rear. This reduction in height and bulk to accommodate the largest piece of machinery has been achieved with a beak type overhang roof and a lower rear pitch. You'll see on the elevation drawings, they also show its distance from and lower height relationship with the listed building, significantly more than less than the the last proposal. Two local ward councillors now agree that the building represents what the committee was looking for. Councillor Jackson remains concerned after visiting the site with Councillor Hayward. And at the time of the visit, she expressed an understanding of the need of a building of the size proposed, but later suggested a reduction in size that would be impractical for the use it was needed for. The hay barn referred to in the officer's report cannot accommodate the quantity of hay that's now being produced on the site. The applicants do own 23 acres, but they manage a further seven. None of the other buildings can perform the same function as this one. Madam Chairman, apart from ward councillors, it seems that no others advise you that they had actually visited the site at the last uh, meeting. The report introduces matters which are not felt to be relevant last time. The case officer herself conducted a company site visit as part of the first application and saw all of the existing buildings and their uses, and yet on this occasion their use and function has been introduced as a material consideration. The site's not in the AOB, the building would have a, have a simple agricultural appearance and be located close to existing buildings, uh, part of an existing group and partly screened from view. And unlike the last time, this time the landscape architect was asked very late in the consideration to comment as he expressed concerns, concerns he didn't have in respect to the larger utilitarian building that was fused in January. We don't know if he was advised of the committee's guidance. The applicants would be willing to provide a suitable landscape mitigation scheme if required as a condition of planning permission. And can I thank you for allowing me to speak in support of this application? Thank you, Mr. Brecken. Um, right, now we go to the ward members. Um, Councillor Ian Hall. Is he here? I'm here, Chair. I'm here. Right, would you uh, like to speak? Yeah, thank you, Chair. And um, I've been listening intently. The, the applicant reflected upon the original uh, determination which which as you will remember i felt was the correct decision the applicant has uh, listened and reflected and has submitted this amended application and this is why i on as a consultee recommended approval the actual design is more amiable to what we're looking for the reduction in height is also and i do not believe this is going to be having the impact which was the original application. 
And as it's already been uh, said, that there's 28 free acres plus another seven. And as it was indicated already, the free go and go back to the drawing board, this is exactly what they have done. They have therefore lowered the height. I wonder how much lower they would actually need to go to actually get the uh, support uh, of, of, of certain uh, individuals. But all I would say is on balance, keeping in mind the original application, I was actually in favor of the, uh, the, the committee's decision to not approve. But now looking at this on the resubmission of this application on the free go, I maintain that my view is that recommendation should be approved. Thank you very much, Chair. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor Hall. Councillor Sarah Jackson. Councillor Jackson, is she here? I am here, thank yeah. you. Yeah, okay, five minutes. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Excellent, thank you. Um, uh, so I visited the site um, where the applicant was kind enough to talk me through their plans and show me the equipment they hoped uh, would be stored in the, the buildings that are proposed or the building that's proposed, sorry. Um, I hope that all members of the committee have read my comments because they were quite comprehensive. Um, but I, I do know, however, that the applicant has responded to some of the suggestions and points raised, um, but I feel that some of those may have been taken out of context, um, but they certainly don't address the concerns that I hold regarding this current application. Um, to be clear, I'm not against the principle of, a, of an appropriately sized storage facility um, on this site where there is a justified need in planning terms. <laughs> I hope those consultee comments demonstrate this. However, my primary concern still remains. The scale, dominance and impact of the listed building has not been addressed by this new application. And whilst I'm grateful to the applicant uh, for submitting amended plans, taking on board some of the uh, previous comments. Um, I don't feel that these changes are significant enough to allay my, uh, my concerns. In fact, with the increased width of the proposed building compared to the previous application, arguably it could pose even greater visual impact to the previous application, which was refused. I've made a number of suggestions uh, to the applicant um, and admittedly some of these might not be practicable. Um, but I'm sure that an alternative solution could be achieved, um, although um, the applicant seems unwilling to explore this at this current point in time. Um, I do sympathise with the applicant's desire to store their expensive plant equipment, um, and I, re I recognise um, that they claim to be undertaking works of community value uh, with this equipment, like ditch clearing and hedgerow maintenance, um, and I commend them for this, um, although... Uh, as previously stated by one of the objectors uh, on, their, on their own land, that would be something they'd be required to do anyway. Um, however, uh, these are still substantial pieces of equipment for what is a relatively small land holding, uh, currently being used for recreational equestrian purposes. And the storage of portable equipment can't be the basis of planning decisions for permanent structures in isolation. Uh, what would happen if the applicant decided to acquire a new larger tractor or JCB? Would they seek to raise the roof of this building or even apply for a larger building still? Uh, neither can we justify it based on tidying up the site um, as the items could be stored elsewhere um, and arguably the equipment that's there at the moment sits well below the fence level and is obscured uh, from the road. Uh, amongst all of the contributions made, we really must consider the comments for, from the conservation officer, given the site's proximity to those two listed buildings, and the officer has been quite firm in their assertions. She observed that an incremental development of this site has resulted in the detrimental impact to the area, and she goes on to say that this has severely diminished the setting um, and that further development will further erode this character. Um, so as it stands, I, I can't support it and I hope the committee find um, a, a, refusal, a refusal most um, applicable in this instance. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. <clears throat> Councillor Andrew Moulding, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, 
uh, the applicants, I believe, have listened very carefully to the members of the committee at the last meeting, and they're now, as you're aware, have submitted this revised application for a general reduced height and significantly more appropriate cladding and roofing materials. The function of the building is for storage of equipment, which currently is sited around the site. Uh, those who have visited the site will also have seen a huge bulk of haylage, which badly needs to be kept under cover. I think we all recognise that you collect haylage when it's available, you have to keep it under store, and you have to keep it under cover. Uh, so that is the necessity for the scale of the building. Councillor Jackson mentioned uh, that plant could be hired in, but not only would that be extremely expensive, but is that practical? For every time a bundle of haylage needs to be moved, you'd have to hire in some equipment. I don't think so. Let us consider the location of the barn and the perceived concern over its situation in the setting of the two listed buildings. Now, I've been to the site and it would be impossible to see the proposed barn from either of these two listed buildings other than from one small bedroom window of Rose Cottage. I've driven past the site from both directions, from Wick and from Woodbury, and due to the fencing and trees already in situ, the only uh, uh, recognised uh, situation where you could see the building, the proposed building, would be from the entrance gateway as you drive by. I cannot understand the concerns from the residents of Annings Farm and Wick Farm, as it would be absolutely impossible to see the new barn from these locations. The report considers agricultural need. The applicant is not having sheep grazing, which they at one time considered, but they are already in initiated the introduction of Galloway cows. And uh, they will got a farm account, which has been created in order that surplus haylage can be acquired and distributed to neighboring farms. The landscape officer suggested landscape mitigation. Some of this has already been carried out, but the uh, applicants will be prepared to continue that um, landscape mitigation work if necessary. The report also assumes there is no public benefit regarding the need for this equipment. In fact, the applicant uses the machinery, as I think some uh, speakers have already indicated, for ditch clearing and hedge cutting in the local lanes. And that, of course, is no longer carried out by the county council. And in bad weather, the applicant uses the machinery for snow clearing in the local hamlet, together with spreading salt on icy roads. And that is essential in this small hamlet. I maintain my previous support for this application. This will enable the applicants to keep their equipment under cover, together with the haylage, which is a valuable commodity for those living in the countryside. In my view, there is no harm to the settings of the listed buildings, and my view is that the application should be approved. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Moulding. Right, um, now to committee, um, Councillor Skinner. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, um, Madam Chair. And um, uh, my name was mentioned in dispatches as I, uh, supported the application in principle, but some, some modifications to be made, and I believe those modifications have been met. I think question I would like to ask if I could, Mr. Rose, please. Would Mr. Rose, would, could you be clear on some of the buildings? When you showed, you showed a picture of the, pre, the buildings that are already on site, uh, there was several sort of a jumble of buildings and it sort of whipped through fairly quickly, really. Um, and I was sort of wanting to see, yeah, that's it, these sorts of bits. And there was another one, not dissimilar. That, that's it, that, that's that sort of thing. So I understand probably the um, horse building there, the one that says Fay is a stable. So we're not, the application doesn't affect, it's not implicating stable. So on that basis, I can imagine that those buildings would be stained. But my question to Mr. Rose is if, if he knows, um, if not, perhaps if Mr. Brecken is still there, we can ask the questions, which buildings are looking be removed because you did mention, I believe, some mentioned that there was some buildings going to be removed. 
No, there's no there's no buildings to be removed, Councillor Skinner. This is this is an, an, a new building for that range of uses that the applicant has outlined, partly for equestrian, partly for the haylage, partly for the storage of, of okay. their machinery. Okay, thank you. Well, that clears that one up then. That, in my head, I just wanted to uh, understand what that was. Um, no, in going in going forward, uh, I I think the applicants have have made uh, some changes to fit into the site. I absolutely understand um, uh, what is being said here, and the, and really, with the balance here is between uh, a, a need on this site. I think there is a need. I'm, I'm a farmer myself, and uh, this machinery is is not expensive. But I don't think the application could be judged just merely on a JCB because obviously you could take the JCB to somewhere else or. It could be outside and it's not a mitigating um, um, position to be in. But there are other uh, factors there in somebody putting up what would be a general purpose building. I believe that's really what we're looking at for what's going to be on this site and it's harm on, on the setting. I take on board very much what Councillor Moulding has spoken about and in fact Councillor Hall as well. And I take on board what Councillor Jackson has said and that's the balance that we have and the dilemma that we have here today. For my, my position, Madam Chair, uh, I'm going to be relatively swift on this one because it all seems fairly clear to me uh, as to what it is. I think the applicants have managed to overcome some of the issues that myself and Councillor Howe, and it's a pity Councillor Howe isn't here because if Councillor Howe was here, of course, he may have been able to support and back up uh, what I was saying because we're all in the same place. There's a lot of sympathy, including from Councillor Jackson, a lot of sympathy for this, this application. And I don't think, personally speaking, my view uh, is that the harm to this is going to outweigh uh, uh, putting up a building in this way and cutting it in, making it lower and all the rest of it. So I'm actually going to be uh, going, uh, making a recommendation, going against the recommendation refusal uh, and go for a recommendation of support. Indeed, if I get support for that and get seconded, uh, but that's my view. I've listened to what the ward members have to say from both sides, good arguments, both sides, um, but on balance, from where I'm sat and, and the fact that the applicant had had a second go has mitigated some of those, one or two of those issues that we had previously. And that's what we asked them to do. Done that. As far as I'm concerned, I'm making a recommendation for approval for this application. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Councillor Skinner. And um, before I invite a seconder, I would <clears throat> emphasise that in both of these applications that have come before us, the, the views of the conservation officer is that it would harm the setting of the listed building. Um, and, you know, I mean, if we think we know more than a conservation officer, what's the point of having a conservation officer? So um, having said that, is there a second of the Councillor Skinner's proposal, please? I'll, yes, I'll second it. Pook. Who is that, Councillor Brown? Pook. Pook, would you like to speak, Councillor Pook? Yes, please. Thank you very much. Yes. I was very pleased to see this application come back because it was very close last time. Um, and I feel it's, uh, it, it had a lot of so much merit. I've also not actually been on site, but I drove past on my way back um, from uh, Bridport the other day and drove around the lane. So I do know the, 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 sort of the general position. I think this is, comes down to a couple of fundamental things. This is, a, this is an agricultural setting. In agricultural settings, you have farms, and farms, you have barns. A barn in this setting is not out of, out of the question, out of context at all. So its setting, I think, is, is, is entirely reasonable and entirely to be expected. Um, as I say, it's an agricultural setting. It's not a, um, a it's, it's not a sort of chocolate box cottages we've got to protect. We've got to protect the whole environment. East Devon was made up of farms and farms had all these buildings around them. Some of them have got eroded away where they become private homes. They've become the, the sort of, the, just, the, just the cottage now. But, you know, the, originally um, it was a working area and you had this range of buildings there. There is an agricultural use, and the application applicant has explained that. Um, and you know, it's not our position to tell him how he should operate his business. But from the information he's given, um, you can see that 
you know, the building's got to be a specific size or a minimum size to hold equipment, to hold materials and things. There was comment about um, storage of haylage on different, in different buildings. Um, whether it's a building on a different part of the site, I don't know. But if you want to keep the building, if you're talking about the buildings which we've seen photographs of, and I saw as I drove by, they aren't really buildings for holding, you know, large amounts of haylage or anything. So, you know, you need something which you can get in with a machine. And, and also, as um, Councillor Skinner said, you know, the machine needs to be on site. You don't need to be hiring, hiring something in every time you want to move it. <clears throat> and I say, it's, it's, um, it's the, the mode of operation the applicant wants to work in, and it's entirely compatible with an agricultural use. Um, the applicants followed the advice of the previous committee, um, it's reduced it and changed it, change it, um, it, its aspects and changed its height and materials, and he's followed that. So, you know, if we ask someone to follow something and then they follow it and we don't, don't, um, uh, don't take notice of that, you know, what's it, you know, what's the point of us making comments and what's the point of them making efforts? So just to sum up, in my opinion, the negative impact is minimal um, because of what I can actually see from the road as I drove by. But I think in, con in the context of the agricultural setting, in the rural environment, there isn't really a negative impact because it's an agricultural building in an agricultural um, environment. So I can see no reason for, um, uh, for opposing it. And I'm very happy to second the recommendation to approve. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Key. <clears throat> Thank you, um, Chair. Um, yeah, a couple of points I've got. In actual fact, the original application um, the height was six meters, uh, sorry, it was 5.2 meters, not six meters. And so all it's been reduced really is 200 millimeters, which to me is not a big reduction in size of this um, building. Plus the fact I've got a recollection that it's been made longer than what the original application is. So I'm not quite sure what that entails, whether that's uh, acceptable. The materials, yes, uh, I can accept that sort of thing. What does concern me is that we heard from Councillor Moulding that um, the, this person in actual fact with the digger does um, contract digging and uh, hedge trimming and such like. But And the concern is, is this going to turn into a contractor's yard where you get all machinery everywhere and then we should be wanting more and more buildings put up. That's the thing that concerns me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Key, but we, we can't go on supposition or speculation. We have to judge this one as it is before us. Um, Councillor Brown. Thank you, Chair. Um, these photos that are on show for this particular application are probably sort of seven months old or so because they're the same photos that were shown last time round in January. Um, you know, there's no leaves on the trees, you know, um, and if you go to the second photo down, which is the cottage, um, you've got a tree there on the right-hand side not that one. It will be, keep going, that one there. Um, you've got a tree there with no leaves on it whatsoever. And it, as you drive past and look at this, where the site is going to be, which is behind those trees, you can't see it at all. So there's no visual impact on the surrounding areas. I mean, the height of it is no higher than that um, shed that you can see behind the fence at the moment. Um, with the tree behind it, I mean, it won't be visible at all. Um, you know, you, like, like uh, Councillor Moulding said, as you drive past that site, and I've driven past that site, you will not, it will not make any impact on the landscape because it won't be seen. The only way you can see it, again, as um, uh, Councillor Moulding said, is if you stop and look over the fence. Otherwise, it's not visible at all. So I can't see any reason for refusing it on the grounds that... Um, the, the committee have been told. Therefore, I support the application. Thank you. Councillor Pratt. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, if you look at the relationship elevation plan, this clearly shows that the height of the proposed barn does not harm in any way Rose Cottage. I, as other members of the, of the committee have said, uh, with the trees uh, which are shown on that plan uh, between the proposed barn and the, the, there's a shed, then the cottage, uh, it's clear that uh, there is no harm at all to the construction of this barn. Um, on top of that, we hear from Alan Brecken that the applicants are willing to provide a suitable landscape mitigation scheme as a condition of planning permission. So they can do no more than that. And uh, I'm, I'm fully supporting this application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Pratt. Um, could I go to Mr. Rose, please? Um, um, just say that, ask him if this application uh, were to be refused, what would be the chances of it succeeding at appeal? Can you give a guesstimate? Oh, okay. I can't. I can't. I can't give you a percentage. Uh, no. But you know, we 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 wouldn't be recommending refusal if we didn't have a good chance no. uh, at appeal. Uh, but the debate that members are having is exactly the sort of uh, exactly the uh, the issues that the inspector will be looking at in terms of uh, has the proposal been justified? What's the visual impact to the property? And does that harm the listed building? Uh, we, we as officers and the conservation officer uh, feels it does, but I, I can't really put a, put a percentage on it other than saying that, you know, I, I think it's more likely to be dismissed at appeal than not. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Davy. Thank you, Chair. Well, I, I feel somebody needs to speak in support of the conservation officer and, and the local residents that we've heard from. Essentially, what we're looking at here is a garage, isn't it? It's, it's a building for the storage of machinery and equipment. Um, so perhaps to describe it as a barn um, is uh, it's, it's kind of playing a little bit fast and loose with the truth. I don't know. Um, however, it's referred to as a barn in the application. And um, I, I just want to quote from the report, actually, because I feel as though we've introduced a lot of um, issues here which are actually not relevant. And we're questioning whether it would harm the um, listed buildings. Um, Members don't seem to think so, but most of us haven't visited the site. And the conservation officer, who presumably has, um, is of the opinion that it does. And I, I would just like to refer to the report. The acceptability of the proposed barn for mixed agricultural um, use depends in part upon it being reasonably necessary and proportionate in scale relative to the size of the land holding and the existing activity taking place on the applicant's land and the existing storage available, which we will note has grown considerably over the years and the conservation officer makes reference to that as well. Given the relatively small scale of the land holding, the small scale nature of the equine use, together with the limited information provided regarding agricultural activities, it's difficult to understand why two tractors and a utility vehicle are required in relation to the existing land use. And I just wonder whether some of this equipment is actually used elsewhere. We've, we've heard reference to um, the, the applicant being very helpful to neighbours and so on, which is great, but isn't particularly a justification um, for the amount of equipment that they're storing here. Um, so I question whether this is actually for agricultural use on the land um, that they own and is actually a kind of business um, that is operating from this land which which kind of brings in a, a different set of criteria. Um, uh, I, I'd also uh, mention, uh, I think this is the conservation officer's uh, comments, an examination of the evolution of the site using historic aerial photographs, so he's done a lot of research, indicates the number of buildings and the extent of the land use for stabling, loose boxes, etc. has grown considerably over time. Um, 
and uh, the conservation officer considers the setting of the listed buildings has already been severely diminished by the incremental erosion of their rural green agricultural setting. Um, I accept that, yes, farms need buildings in the countryside and sometimes we just have to put up with that. Um, but it does feel as though the case for this has actually not been established. Um, and I don't know why the applicant hasn't perhaps um, provided more information on that or perhaps they feel that the storage of equipment is sufficient for that. Um, uh, and it says again uh, in the case that all the equipment currently stored outside which is proposed to be stored inside the new barn were genuinely ancillary to the existing land use this point might be considered to weigh in favour of the proposal but for the reasons given under the principle above it's not considered this has been demonstrated in the in the application so yeah in spite of all the other um, criteria that members have, have introduced and the questioning of the conservation officer's comments, I feel as though in this case um, I want to respect what our officers have said and uh, continue to refuse this application and I, I think an inspector would agree with us. Thank you Councillor Davy. <clears throat> I think you, you made the point there that um, Councillor Key had made as well whether it could be um, used for um, other operations off-site. Councillor Gazard. Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, well, I'll be brief. Um, thank you, Councillor Davey. Um, you must have been reading my script. I fully concur with the comments that you've made, and um, I, I can't see any justif say, justification why um, you know, I, I could feel that I could support this. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Woodward. Thank you, Chair. Um, we debated this earlier in the year, and I, I think it's, um, I think very little has changed. The height um, is slightly reduced, but it's still a large um, building, even in, increased in the width, I understand, and length. So uh, I still see that the, um, there's no public benefits which uh, would outweigh the harm to the, um, the, the nature of the other buildings around it and the, the village. So I'm uh, supporting the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Desarum. Good morning. Thank you, Chair. I, I just referred the committee to Councillor Moulding's earlier helpful comments uh, about the public benefit. Um, in particular, I think Councillor Moulding is recorded as saying there's ditch, ditch clearing in local lanes and essential snow clearing. So I think that if um, members are minded to approve this application, uh, Councillor Moulding has given some public benefits uh, as to why we could uh, take this position. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. There are no more speakers. Um, over to Mrs. Shaw to sum up, please. Thank you, Chair. Yes. So members, from my notes, I have that you are recommending um, approval, contrary to officers' recommendation, for the reasons that the application would not impact on the rural setting or the setting of the listed building. Is that correct? Uh, Councillor Pook here. I don't yeah. know if Councillor Skinner yeah. wants to go first, but I was seconding it. Yeah, yeah so that's, that is correct. But al you. also the evidenced, um, evidenced agricultural need. Um, so as we got the impact on it, the, in, uh, the impact on the um, conservation setting, but the evidence agricultural need. There is sufficient um, evidence. I believe, yes. Agricultural need. Mm. Okay. Therefore, could I suggest the mover and the seconder that any conditions are delegated to officers? As long as they are uh, delegated with the uh, ward members, please. Okay. Yes. And usually the chair, isn't it? Yes, chair and ward members. Yeah. Thank you. Therefore, members, you've just heard that um, <coughs> when your name is called, please would you indicate whether you're in support of the motion to recommend approval with delegation of conditions to officers in consultation with the chair and ward members? 
whether you are in support of the motion, whether you're against the motion to recommend approval or whether you're abstaining from the vote. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Councillor Bloxham. I'm going to support the motion to approve. Councillor Brown. Support. Councillor Chamberlain. I'm going to abstain. Thank you. Councillor Davy. Against. Thank you. Councillor Desaran. In support of the motion to recommend approval. Councillor Gazard. Against. Councillor Key. Against. Councillor Lawrence. Support. Councillor Pook. Support. Councillor Pratt. Support. Councillor Skinner. Support. Councillor Woodward. Against. Councillor Rag. Against. Okay, thank you. So we have one um, abstention. One, two, three, four, five um, against, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in support. So I can advise the application has been recommended for approval. Thank you, Wendy. <clears throat> right, agenda item 11, application 210587, full 21 Helen Road, X mile pages 51 to 66. Um, and welcome to the meeting, uh, Edward Gregson Williams and Demelza Tucker. Are they in the meeting, please? <clears throat> Present. Yes, I'm here as well. Okay, thank you. Madam um, Chair, could I be, could I be uh, out, out of this meeting? This is uh, application. Yes, yeah, you did say, Councillor Skinner, all the, the reasons. Yeah. I, I, I'm oh. assuming the reasons are connected with by stop call, because I see that one of the... Um, or the applicant is a, used to be on by stop call to state. Is that right? Councillor Skinner's in the waiting room now. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I, I seem to have read that somewhere. Um, <clears throat> right. Um, Mr Rose, could you present your report, please? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so this is application for uh, construction of a replacement dwelling so you can see the site location here so this this dwelling on here and as I go through you'll see it's to replace this uh, bungalow with a two-story building on this southern part of the site and you can see the relationship to the to the surrounding properties which I'll talk through in a bit more detail uh, off Holland Road and the applications here because uh, there's a uh, ward member objection to the to the proposal um, so this is the, the layout of the site at the moment so you can see the two-story properties on Phillips Avenue to this side uh, number 23 to the north that shares its access with number 21 and the properties on the other side of the road. So this is the existing uh, layout. So we've got a bungalow here, garages at the back. Uh, so there we go. And you can see the bits in uh, yellow that are to be, to be demolished. Uh, and this is are the elevations of the, the property at the moment. And I'll show you some photos of those. So this is the, the property to be demolished. And this is the proposed layout. So you can see the, the bungalow that was here has been demolished, replaced with a two-story dwelling set, in, set down in the ground uh, with a new uh, garage to serve it. And then the access, uh, which also serves number 23, is widened to get greater visibility and turning within the site. Uh, so these are the floor floor plans. Uh, we've got usual kitchen, living room, dining room at ground floor, and then four bedrooms at uh, the first floor. Uh, and you'll note uh, limited windows that I'll, I'll talk you through and the roof plan. Um, so we, these are the elevations uh, of the building. So you can see it's two storey, but with the, the, the upper storey partly within the roof space to keep the, the heights of the buildings uh, down. This is the main elevation that faces out towards the garden 
uh, and you can see uh, other elevations here with minimal windows, which I'll, I'll talk through. Uh, and there we have the street scene. So this is from the street, the existing uh, bungalow on the site. You can see dotted in outline here to be removed, replaced by the garage and then by the, uh, the dwelling. Uh, and you can see the height and relationship relative to those properties at the rear on, on Phillips Avenue. Um, and again, yes, here are, here are relationships uh, of the proposed dwelling to those properties uh, on Phillips Avenue uh, and the, the distances uh, involved. And again, 22 metres from the property to uh, the rear of number 12 there. And these are the photos. So this is the, the bungalow at the moment. You can see slightly raised above the, above the ground level with a new dwelling to go on this side. And you can see the relationship to the, to the properties to the rear. Um, there we go. So we're in the built up area boundary. So the principle of a replacement dwelling is acceptable in principle. So the main issues you'll see in the report are the character and appearance of the, the proposal and the impact on amenity and highway safety. In terms of uh, visual impacts, there's a wide variety of styles of dwellings locally. So the design's considered to be acceptable. I think you can see in the uh, in these images that we, this bungalow is of a different design to those properties. So uh, the style of the proposal is acceptable. Uh, whilst the building is slightly larger and be slightly more prominent in the in the street than the existing dwelling, it will be as a seen as a dwelling next to a highway, uh, which isn't unusual or out of character. Uh, the dwelling's cut slightly into the site to reduce its impact. Um, I think you can see here from the section the relationship of the heights of the existing bungalow to the proposed dwelling, uh, and it's not considered that it'd be incongruent or visually intrusive uh, in, in the streets, so the design is considered to be acceptable. With regard to amenity it, uh, on the neighbours, it's a smaller footprint, but it's two-storey in nature, so you can see, the, see for yourself the change in position and the change of the bulk of the building. Um, but as I've mentioned, they've produced low eaves to put part of the upper floor within the roof space. Uh, as I mentioned, the properties on Phillips Avenue are uh, in excess of, uh, generally in excess of 21 metres uh, from uh, the windows uh, of the proposed dwelling, uh, which is a, a sort of guide of a suitable distance uh, for, for acceptable distances. Uh, the main uh, elevations are to the south here looking out. So we've only got one uh, high level bathroom window in the elevation facing back to those properties, which can obviously be obscure glazed. Uh, there will, there is mention in the report of uh, overshadowing. Uh, there's shadow plans submitted with the application that show that the relocation of the dwelling on the plot will cause some potential for overshadowing of the bottom of the gardens of the adjoining properties, uh, mainly during the winter months when the sun's very low. Uh, and whilst there might be some additional overshadowing of parts of the bottom of the garden, that isn't detrimental enough for us to be able to uphold a, a refusal on, on appeal. Uh, so a, a degree of impact, but that impact is, is considered to be acceptable and not unusual. In terms of highway safety, it's a replacement dwelling, so there should be no greater uh, movements. There might be more bedrooms. That doesn't necessarily mean there would be more greater movements, vehicle movements. And as I said, the access is shared at the moment with uh, it's narrow access shared with number 23. Uh, that act, that's going to remain, but the access is going to be widened. There's going to be improved visibility and turning on site for vehicles. So there's an improvement in highway safety terms from the proposal. Uh, so to sum up, the visual impact of the proposal is considered to be accept acceptable. The design minimises the impact on neighbours and, and gets that to an acceptable level that uh, officers don't feel we'd be able to justify refusal of. And there are highway safety benefits from the proposal. Um, so in light of that, uh, our officer recommendation is for approval. And just one uh, error to apologise on the report. Um, you'll see that we've conditions six and seven on there are identical. So we've duplicated a condition. So one of those uh, is no longer, it isn't required, but other than that recommended approval. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right, now we go to the objectors. Um, Edward Gregson Williams, um, welcome to the meeting. You have three minutes. 
Thank you. Uh, morning. Uh, as immediate neighbours to the site, I'm of the view that the proposed development uh, will firstly harm our standards of living uh, through overshadowing and loss of natural sunlight, and I'll get onto that, and secondly will have a potentially serious implication to road safety. Um, the applicant has provided uh, a sunlight path analysis in the design and access statement, uh, but there is key data missing. Uh, particularly on the shadowing effect caused in the early mornings um, and particularly in the summer. Uh, and this is in the primary immunity of my property. Uh, secondly, I noted the shadowing effects overall were being heavily understated. Uh, so the sunlight analysis appears to show this two-storey building with pitched roof producing negligible shadowing on neighbouring properties. Uh, and this is particularly curious given the similar height two-storey buildings on the opposite side of Holland Road appear to cast lengthy shadows throughout the day. Um, and uh, through my investigation, I've learned these properties have a similar roof ridge line and they're almost identical in height. Um, when I contacted the architect to query this data, I was surprised to learn that these images cannot be categorized as a professional light impact study. They're made using a 3D modeling software named SketchUp. Uh, and in my correspondence with the architect, uh, they replied, quote, we do not intend to provide any detailed professional light impact studies. And they, quote, see no reason to request detailed uh, light impact modeling and expert advice. As an immediate neighbor uh, to the site uh, who will be impacted by this development, is it not reasonable to request the fuel, full due diligence is undertaken by the applicant? I don't see how we can have any confidence in the images provided. Furthermore, uh, this is the third iteration of the design and access statement, and it's remarkably light on detail. Uh, so it raises the question, are there other elements which are not disclosed and deemed insignificant by the applicant? Uh, with regards to road safety, uh, the applicant claims that design, uh, the access to the site will be made via the existing driveway to 2123 Hallam Road. Meanwhile, they're obviously understating the significance of this remodeling. Uh, by widening this, exact, this existing access point, this will create a new driveway opposite a junction to Springfield Road, which will in itself pose a risk to vehicles emerging and turning from the junction, as well as those vehicles accelerating up Hallam Road, having just navigated a sharp bend in the road by the rugby club. Furthermore, the proposed vehicular turning point on the site, I believe is wholly inadequate. Uh, the applicant has claimed the T-shaped turning point will allow vehicles to turn on site, so there'll be no reversing onto Holland Road. Given this is a four bedroom property, it is therefore reasonable to expect there may be more than one vehicle making use of this entrance and 30 driveway. 30 seconds left. Due to the nature of this, uh, this um, T-shaped turning point, it is absolutely incontrovertible that if there is any vehicle already parked on the driveway, any further vehicle entering the site will, uh, by facing forward, will need to therefore reverse onto Hullam Road. And this is even more important when we consider the access needs for emergency services or delivery vehicles. Uh, furthermore, this turning point cannot be considered safe when we are aware of numerous road traffic incidents in recent years, including one fatality. So in conclusion, I believe the introduction of this development will bring about more harm than benefit to the local residents of Phillips Avenue and Holland Road, and therefore would recommend uh, the EDTC refuse the application on the grounds of inadequate plans and risk to local traffic. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Charlotte House, uh, I believe you have a statement, Wendy. I do. Yes, I do, Chair. So uh, the following written statement from Charlotte House um, also reflects um, the residents of 12 Phillips Avenue, Exmouth. As immediate neighbours, we would like to formally state our objections to the revised plans which were submitted on the 2nd of June 2021. Whilst we do not object to the site being redeveloped, in fact, quite the opposite, we still have several concerns which are as follows. Number one, overshadowing and loss of light, of loss of natural light, as documented in our letter from the 12th of April 2021, the submitted sun path analysis does not show the true situation at the back of our property. This was evidenced in photos two and three of that letter. We therefore still have concerns that the building of the planned property would cause a significant, significant overshadowing and a loss of light in our garden and primary living spaces, thus leading to a loss of amenity. Number two, loss of the aspect and morning light across the whole boundary. The newly submitted plan, proposed street section 02, confirms that the footprint of the proposed property has moved down the site and would cover the whole boundary with number 21 Hullam Road. 
At present, from the ground floor of our property, we can see very little of the existing house and it does not back onto our boundary. This fundamental and major change would mean that we would lose all the current aspect from the back of our property where our primary living spaces are located. Furthermore, as shown in photograph one of the letter submitted on the 12th of April, since the back of our property faces east, the sunrise and morning light will be lost. Again, both these issues would lead to a loss of amenity. Number three, trees and landscaping. The proposed planting scheme for this application shows no plans to replace any of the trees which were removed along the boundary with number 21. We find this irregular and after consulting a landscape gardener, we have planted two trees along this boundary on our property. We would like to make the East Devon District Council tree officer aware as they should be included in the plan scheme for protecting existing trees. That is cited under A in their comments, comments from Friday the 16th of April 2021. Number four, building control, HSE and conditions for building. The existing house is a non-standard construction and is known to contain asbestos. Furthermore, development of the site is going to cause significant traffic and noise disruption. We would like to be reassured that East Ham District Council would ensure that the redevelopment conforms with the HSE CDM regulations and that the tree and ecology officers would visit the site to ensure that submitted plans are delivered. With the number of adjoining residential boundaries and with Time many homeowners... Thank you. I've just got a sentence if I could finish. And with many homeowners now working from home, we assume that conditions of the time of day, the building work must start and finish will be applied. Thank you, Wendy. <clears throat> um, next, we have the applicant, Demelza Tucker. Now, here, I, I knew I'd seen something. Um, there was an email that was sent to Democratic Services um, by Mrs. Tucker, which was sent, certainly I had it, I don't know whether other members did, but it was a lobbying email in support of the application. Um, and in the interests of probity, I would like to ask, um, Mrs. Tucker in her email said that um, she had lived uh, on part of the Bystock Court estate. Um, and Councillor Skinner, when he declared an interest and asked to leave, he was rather vague. So I, I in the interest of probity, probity solely and to be absolutely transparent um i think that councillor skinner should really declare what his specific interest is and i would like to also ask mrs tucker um who's applied under skinner construction limited um to establish that whether or not there is a connection with Councillor Skinner. We, we have to be absolutely above board with all of this. Thank you. Um, Mrs Tucker, you have three minutes. Uh, morning. Um, I'm here today on behalf of myself, my husband and our children. Um, I've lived in Exmouth all my life. Um, for the last 11 years, we've um, lived in the Bystock Estate, uh, where we have an acre of land. But our circumstances have changed quite dramatically over the last couple of years. My husband's now seriously ill. And looking ahead, I'm not going to be able to maintain our current property on my own. So um, it's become our ambition to uh, build a new home at 21 Hullam Road. Um, and to be clear, we're not making this application as a developer, we're making it as a local family. Um, there are six supporters to our application. However, we respect there are also four objectors. So we've been working with our planning consultant and your officer to make amendments where necessary. And can I stress that we've also provided all information and supporting documents that have been requested and required. Uh, the existing bungalow on the site is very tired and unsightly. It's been empty for years. It's, uh, the fact that it's not traditional construction means that it's unviable for refurbishment. 
Um, construction health and safety has been my career for the last 10 years. So, of course, any demolition works would be carried out in accord with the CDM regulations, HSC guidelines and uh, building regs and building control. And obviously it goes without saying asbestos control can only, uh, asbestos removal can only be done by a licensed contractor under controlled conditions. <laughs> um, the current ve vehicular access is substandard and it requires reversing onto Hallam Road. So our proposal removes the need for reversing. It provides turning, ample off-street parking for more than one car, makes the wider entrance with better visibility, which will benefit both ourselves and our immediate neighbours at number 23, who are in support of our application. Um, on page 57 of the officer's report, the County Council identified that improved visibility and turning would be a benefit. Re relating to sunlight, your officer recognises on page 62 that would not be any substantive loss of sunlight and no loss of daylight. She identifies that a refusal of planning permission on this basis could not be sustained. Um, regardless of the reasonableness of our original proposal, uh, assisted by the LPA, we have made adjustments, including reducing the dwelling size. As identified on page 61 of the officer's report, the proposed dwelling would have a smaller footprint and would be the same height as the existing. Your officer goes on to point out that the only first floor window uh, facing Phillips Avenue would be an obscured bathroom window. And she say, states there would be no loss of privacy for the residents of Phillips Avenue. It should be noted that there are currently three first floor windows that overlook Phillips Avenue. Hallam Road is diverse and of mixed character. It has some single storey, but more commonly two storey properties, many much more significant in height and footprint than our proposal. Uh, the houses in Phillips Avenue to the west of the site actually dwarf our proposed building, some being three metres higher. Um, the application site's a generous plot. Um, we will retain a significant garden and the proposed building would be located away from boundaries with neighbours and then our own planting in theirs would provide a pleasant and appropriate screen. Um, of course, we support the conditions suggested by your officer and appreciate, I appreciate the opportunity to speak directly to you all. And I know this um, proposal will meet our family's needs and I hope you can support us. Thank you. And um, could you at this point, Mrs Tucker, say whether or not there is a connection between Skinner Construction and Councillor Skinner? There's no con there's no connection between. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I'm I was hoping to hear that. Um, okay. Thank you, Councillor Megan Armstrong. You have five minutes. Well, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm speaking today on application twenty one oh five eight seven FUL and to object to certain aspects of this amended proposal. As members will be aware, this is the third application for development of this site, the first one being in 2019, which have caused ongoing and troubling concerns for ward members, the town council, and perhaps most importantly, close neighbours. This report helps to ameliorate some of my concerns, and I appreciate that the applicant and officers have gone some way towards mitigating against a few of the more negative issues. I'm pleased that the following have been included either in the report or conditions. One, the removal of permitted development rights, including windows, doors, roof lights, dormers or other openings in the western elevation of the building. This will give much needed reassurance to the close neighbours on Phillips Avenue that further unwanted development of the site cannot take place. Two, a tree protection scheme prior to commencement of any works including those trees or hedges either on or adjacent to the site, which will reassure adjoining neighbours that their own trees will be protected. Three, development to be undertaken in accordance with the conclusions in the preliminary ecological appraisal, hopefully also including hedgehog highways. Just to note that this appraisal is now out of date and was done in June 19 after most of the garden area had been cleared of trees and other vegetation. I would hope that some of the hedges and other vegetation which have since reappeared and presumably are now habitats for varied wildlife will still be, will still be taken into account. Four, reference in the report to the Party Wall Act regarding the removal of part of the garage which forms a boundary with one of the neighbours and the need for the applicant to consult with the adjoining neighbour regarding any works to this wall. 
However, my concerns remain as follows. Firstly, I agree with all the points in Charlotte House statement, which was read out by Wendy, including A, overshadowing and loss of natural light, including the very unclear and confusing submitted sunlight path analysis. I understand that my colleague, Councillor Miller, will be covering this issue in more detail shortly. B, the loss of all aspect and morning light across the whole boundary due to the proposed dwelling being moved substantially southwards from the current property's footprint. Therefore, the latest design and access statements assertion that there would be, quote, similar shadow casting compared to the existing house, unquote, I find very hard to believe. C, building control and health and safety issues, especially regarding the safe removal of asbestos and noise disruption for close neighbours. Secondly, although I partly understand the reasons given for no objection from the County Highways Authority, I still have concerns about the effect of this proposal on Hullam Road traffic and other road users. The new driveway, according to the plans, is quite separate and not simply widened as described in the report. Also, the reference to improved sight lines, which are not the same as an improved visibility display. In my view, the southerly sight line cannot be improved as the sharp blind bend at the end of a short length of Hullam Road will always remain the same. Finally, if this application is approved, I would like to propose the following additional conditions or advice to the applicant on the notice of decision. One, reference to the safe removal of asbestos from the current dwelling, including a link to the legislation which covers such activities. Two, reference to the limited times of activity and the reduction of noise and other disruption on the site to avoid undue disturbance to neighbours. And three, reference to the Party Wall Act and the duties required by the applicant to the affected neighbour, if appropriate. Thank you very much for listening, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Armstrong. Uh, Councillor Miller, please, you have five minutes. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Um, I'm here to uh, uh, support the residents of Hullam Road and Phillips Avenue uh, who are objecting over their concerns, which include overshadowing. Um, I believe the design and access statement, which has been submitted by the applicant, um, is, is potentially spurious. It argues there is a similar shadow casting compared with the existing house with the new proposed dwelling. But on the contrary, I cannot see how this can be the case given that the proposed dwelling is further south than the current one. More broadly, I believe there is incomplete and insufficient information to support the applicants and the officers' argument that any harm over the loss of light would definitely be minor. Therefore, being very concerned about the impact on the residents of Phillips Avenue and agreeing <laughs> completely with all the comments made by um, Edward Gregson Williams, who is a resident of Phillips Avenue um, and his neighbours, I hope that the committee will consider this application very carefully indeed. And I would like to um, end with a few um, points which, which, which may be answered by, by Chris Rose, um, who is a lot more qualified than me in this, in this position. I, I'd like to know why the officers didn't consider it appropriate to request of the applicants professional sunlight path analysis. You know, we can see that this has been a major concern for residents that, that this sunlight path analysis is not uh, it's not complete it's not clear and and, um, and in my view from looking at it I don't believe um, it can be argued strongly that we that that, um, that that they have put forward a convincing case my second sort of point and it, it could be again something that could be answered by Chris Rose over my time watching this committee I've never seen I'm sure it's happened but I've never seen the committee actually um, turn down an application that the officers have recommended um, to, to be approved. I've seen it the opposite way around, but not, but not um, the committee actually refusing something the officer has recommended approval for. Um, often the case, um, the, the, the fact that there is a um, cost for appeal is, is, is mentioned if the appeal is, is won by the, uh, by the applicant and the inspector finds against the council. Um, I often think this has to surely be considered a calculated risk 
um, from committee members. Um, and on a minor application like this, a relatively minor one, what would I, I would like to know um, what the cost to the council would be for losing such an appeal. And I also think surely that surely the committee should be turning down applications where there is incomplete information and, sh and surely it is the applicant's duty to provide um, that professional analysis for the benefit of um, residents who are affected by by this application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, <clears throat> Councillor Miller. Um, now the ward member uh, who's on the committee, Councillor Woodward, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, <laughs> two main issues for me um, relate to the road safety and the road and then the uh, overshadowing and the sunlight. Um, on the road, um, it's right that there is a corner, a bend, and you come up to the house. But I think it's overstated how that, that distance from the corner, if I compare that with um, on Exeter Road, which is um, parallel to this road, there's a similar situation as I come out from Bellevue onto Exeter Road, and that's a much shorter distance between that turning and the corner. I think there's quite a sufficient distance from the corner up to this entrance and a sufficient time to obviously take care, but to be able to get out of that entrance. And the fact that there is a turning point clearly is an advantage uh, over the present situation so that the car can come out forwards. Um, so obviously care is required, but I don't believe, and I go along with the, the County Highways Authority that they have no concerns over the um, highways position. And then the second issue on overshadowing, this, we're in a suburban area. Um, there is some overshadowing now. The house is going to be the same height. It may be further south, but in a suburban setting where houses are all um, along roadsides and backing onto each other, there is inevitably going to be some overshadowing. Again, I am only 100 yards away, my own house from this one. In the mornings, I have to uh, wait an hour or so before um, the sun comes up into the garden because of the houses at the back of me. And also in the afternoon, having a semi-detached house, the adjoining house obscures my garden for an hour or so in the afternoon. So it's inevitable that there's going to be some overshadowing. I think the present occupiers have been very fortunate to date that there hasn't been a building on that part of the garden. Um, but I don't think that's a reason for refusing this application, so I would support the uh, officer's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Woodward. <clears throat> now, before I go to um, committee members, um, could I ask Mr. Rose, please, to comment on the conditions that were requested by Councillor Armstrong? Um, anything about the asbestos and the safety, the hours of construction, um, the party wall, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. So the, the, the reason we haven't put uh, conditions on those three is that they're covered by other legislation. So there's the Party Wall Act itself that covers the party wall. So there's no, no, no need for us to replicate all of that legislation. Yes. The same with asbestos. There's requirements in place, as the applicant said, for their removal that are covered by other legislation. And the same uh, really goes for hours of operation. They would they would be expected uh, hours of construction. They'd be expected to stick to the normal hours of eight till six Saturday mornings, not Sundays and bank holidays. But if there were any work that was carried out outside of that that was harmful, then our environmental health department can go on site and take action against any of those noisy activities. So, in in, in answer to your question, it's because those those issues are covered by other legislation. Thank thank you very much, Mr. Rose. That's helpful. Uh, Councillor Desarum, please. Good morning again. Thank, thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, I, just to say that I have every sympathy with the applicant and those who have expressed their objections. I note that the um, applicant has put that the existing bungalow is very tired and unsightly and it's been empty for years. I, I yeah. fully appreciate that. Um, and I'd like to propose to the committee um, an alternative suggestion for the time being that we, we defer this to get a professional light impact study done um, because it's been it's come up in Councillor Miller's approach when he asked Mr Rose why no professional sunlight path analysis has been done. I appreciate Mr Rose said that we couldn't argue the case to refuse on grounds of overshadowing, but I believe 
that if we are going to make a decision, we actually need to be have it as a committee, just as we get Devon County Highway reports, we need to have a professional light impact study, which will determine precisely what's going to happen. Because Councillor Woodward quite rightly said that you get overshadowing in suburban areas and I totally agree the way the sun moves around but I think for the people who are in objection to this matter they really are worried about this impact of overshadowing and I think that if, if the applicant can produce a professional report which clearly justifies why this overshadowing will not take place then I wouldn't be as uncomfortable uh, to proceed with the recommendation so can I put that out chair by your good self as to whether the committee well, would like would like to get a professional uh, impact study done. Well, be before I take a second look at that, I'd like to go back to Mr. Rose for his comment, please. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so the, the, the applicant has put some information in the design and access statement. They, they didn't need to. Uh, that's not required for uh, this uh, level of uh, application. Uh, and I suppose I, I'm going to make it clear, which maybe the residents of Phillips Avenue won't uh, necessarily agree with, that um, it, it, it's not a judgment of whether there'll be any uh, impact on them. It's whether that impact is going to be harmful enough to justify refusal. Um, and it's quite it, it, it's clear to us as officers that, you know, we've got the plan that the sun will rise in the east. It'll go round to the west. So in those winter months, when the sun is at its lowest in early morning, there will be some shadowing, a potential shadowing at the bottom parts of those gardens. But that's not detrimental enough to be able to justify a refusal. And it certainly won't be harmful to the windows or levels of light in those property, given the distances. And then as soon as that sun starts moving around, the shadow, the shadow will move and move away from those properties. So as we said in the report, I'm, I'm not saying that there won't be any overshadowing of those properties. Uh, but what we're saying, oh, if we were to go to appeal, we wouldn't win an argument on overshadowing because it's going to be so minimal uh, restricted sorry times of the year and times of the day uh, that, that I, I can't see any inspector saying that that in itself will be will be harmful enough to those amenity to uh, to justify refusal so that's the reason that we haven't uh, challenged or gone back and questioned that um, that assessment and it's for those reasons I don't think that we'd be justified for asking for it in this case no I, I see I, <clears throat> I I concur with what you've said um Mr. Rose, um, there'd be absolutely no point in, in deferring this. Um, I have Councillor Key. Councillor Key? Yes, sorry, um, Chair, I couldn't get uh, unmuted. Um, Sorry. Yes, I mean, you know, it's been mentioned quite several times with regard to this backing onto the road. You've only got to look at the report and the uh, highways have no objection whatsoever uh, um, on the application. Um, just to just to clarify from what was mentioned about uh, the committee refusing um, or uh, overturning applications, you will you will know as well as I've done. I've been on the planning now for twenty two years. And we, the number of applications we have overturned one way or the other has been quite considerable. So that clears that up. Um, I can see no problem in this whatsoever. And I'm more than happy to actually put forward um, the recommendation of approval for this application. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a seconder for that, please? Councillor Pook. Councillor Pook, Pook, would you like to yeah, I'll second that. Yeah. Do you like to speak on yes, this? Yes, please, yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, we here, have here a, a fairly simple um, application. Um, I have sympathy for the app for the neighbours, uh, and you know everyone's concerned about anything that happens close to them. But if we actually look at the facts, the highways is no issue. The big fact that everyone's brought up is the um, is the is the shadowing. Um, I've perhaps I, I look at these things more often. I understand and I can appreciate them. Um, and the results of that are, well, the results show there's no issue, as, as Mr. Mr. Rose said. Um, there is nothing I can see here um, that would um, require us to, to uh, refuse it. So I'm wholeheartedly happy to um, support approval. Thank you. Uh, now I'll go to the other committee members. If you have something to add to what's been said already, Councillor Gazard. 
Nothing new to add, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lawrence. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I just wanted to make a point that if you move this property slightly southwards, the overshadowing is, is, is going to be minimally different. Um, and once the sun gets a little bit higher in the sky, um, that there isn't going to be any. And the other thing I can't understand is that um, the occupant of 12 Phillips Avenue, who backs onto here, has decided now to plant some trees. Well, he's going to be overshadowing his own property. So <laughs> I, I can't really see why he's objecting to it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Councillor Davy. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I've got to assure Councillor Miller, this committee has on many occasions turned down applications that were uh, recommended for approval. And in fact, we had one recently uh, that Chair may recall in New Street, we did actually yeah. visit the property. There was considerable overshadowing there, I thought. We turned it down, but it succeeded on appeal. So I don't think this would stand a chance. Um, I understand the, the residents of Phillips Avenue, nobody likes change around them. They've got used to things being a certain way, um, but um, the amount of overshadowing, I think, has got to be pretty minimal. Um, although I do note that by moving the property further south, it does bring it a little closer to, I think it's number 12, well, 12 and 10 and 8, um, in Phillips Avenue and you know there may be some impact on their gardens but the applicants could plant a blooming great tree there um, in their garden and uh, overshadow them that way uh, so I don't think it's it's going to make a lot of difference um, I, I totally agree though with Councillor um, uh, uh, Armstrong about the speeds on Hullam Road. I have seen people absolutely tearing up Hullam Road and uh, it is, you come round the corner, you accelerate up Hullam Road and it, it's quite possible to hit 40 miles an hour by the time you get to Springfield uh, uh, Road. Um, I live very close to this so I know this road very well and I have seen uh, excessive speeds on Hullam Road. The police come and monitor it occasionally uh, but of course everybody Obediently goes past at 30 miles an hour and the police say there's no problem. Um, uh, I think Councillor Armstrong has been campaigning for years for a crossing on Hullam Road. Now this isn't relevant to this application but I've got to say it um, that uh, the, you know something does need to be done there. Um, and um, and also about the uh, preservation of the hedges, uh, I, I did note that the first thing that happened here was that the uh, uh, all the vegetation around the site was cleared um, and um, so uh, I was rather sad to see that but it probably got a bit overgrown over the years um, and um, I hope that, that you know there will be some uh, further landscaping and um, further um, preservation of the hedgerows uh, but the the uh, access is improved and therefore I don't see that there's a, a a problem although I do have to agree about speeds up there but we just have to uh, hope for the best and highways have raised no objections so I haven't got a problem with this. Thank you uh, yes this has been going on for years um uh, the, the question of speeding and I know that there have been surveys done all I can suggest is that those members who are concerned, the residents who are concerned, that they approach their county councillors with a view to it going before the Highways and Traffic Orders Committee. That's, uh, and they'll be able to have their say there. That's the Devon County Council Committee. Um, right. Uh, Councillor Armstrong, um, do you have a question? You, you've just, had your say, you've had your, your time. It, yeah, it was just a comment, uh, Chair, if, if I may, just to say that that has been done regarding the traffic. That has been done a few years ago. It went to committee. It went to full council at county council. So, yeah, okay. we're still working on it, though. Thank you. Yeah, I just okay. wanted to Thank clarify. You Thank you. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Mrs Shaw, to sum up, please. Thank you, members. When your name is called, please will you indicate whether you support the motion to recommend approval, whether you're against the motion to recommend approval, or whether you're abstaining from the vote. Thank you, Councillor Bloxham. Support the motion to approve. Councillor Brown. Support. Councillor Chamberlain. 
Support the motion to approve. Councillor Davey. Support approval. Councillor Dasaran. With reluctance, I have to support the motion to recommend approval. Councillor Gazard. Councillor Gazard. Support, sorry. Thank you. Councillor Key. Approve. <laughs> Councillor Lawrence. Support. Councillor Pook. Support approval. Councillor Pratt. Support approval. Councillor Skinner. Oh no, sorry, he's in the waiting room. Uh, Councillor Woodward. Support. Councillor Rag. Support approval. Thank you. So I can <coughs> advise the application is recommended for approval. Thank you. And um, can we um, go and get Councillor Skinner from the waiting room, please? Yep, I'll do that now. Chair, oh, oh Councillor Skinner's back. Um, could I just ask that uh, Councillor Wibley's uh, apologies be noted? Oh, yes. um, he, uh, he just texted me and said, sorry, forgot to send apologies. So uh, if those could be noted, thanks. Okay, that's noted. Thank you. Um, Chair, could I speak? Councillor Skinner, you've got your hand up. Yes, I just wanted to say, you asked me a question as I was going out and, and yes, before I did. answer the question, I was gone, so I was, sorry, I was gone into the ether. Could you just ask the question again, So, because I didn't hear all of what you said. You started, yeah. I didn't hear. I, and I'm sorry about this, because um, I'd quite forgotten. I knew I'd seen something about Bystock Court somewhere, and I looked back through my emails, and it was in the email that had been sent by the applicant, um, two democratic services who sent it out, certainly to me, and I'm assuming other members had it as well, where um, she said that um, they had lived on land at Bystock Court um, and whether you should be declaring um, an interest there. It's entirely up to you, of course. Uh, my interest being declared, so as it's clear, I, I thought I made it clear at the start, which was that I've received a vitriolic email from these particular people it's way before by stock court it wasn't anything to do uh oh. when i was uh, uh with before my partner bought by stock court so it was nothing to do with that and i don't want to go into it on air if you don't mind but i know that's mind. fine that's why i just wanted clarification everything has to be above board as you know right Thank you. And we move to the next item then 13 application 21 0891 full. It's a minor application for the Hook and Parrot Inn. What a lovely name. Uh, East Walk Seaton. Um, and a welcome to the meeting, Robin Upton, the agent, and the ward members. Um, all three ward members Councillor Hartnell, Councillors Ledger, and Rowland. So, um, over to you, Mr. Rose, to present your report, please. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, I saw that Councillor Bloxham had her hand up, and I think it's gone down now, has it? No, sorry. Thank you. I, I just felt I ought to declare a personal interest at this stage as being a member of the Licensing and Enforcement Committee, as this is for a replacement of a bar and restaurant. But I don't think it will have any impact on the way I vote for the application. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Bloxham. Right, over to you, Mr Rose. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so as I said, this is this relates to the Hook and Parrot Public House on the <coughs> East Walk in uh, Seaton. Um, so you can see the location on the screen here. So this is the roundabout, the Esplanade and the beach. So very prominent on the, on the seafront in a row of some commercial properties. <coughs> um, so it's demolition of the existing public house and the three apartments above uh, and construction of a bar and restaurant in its place and nine apartments above that. Uh, it's here because it's got the support of one of the ward members. You'll also notice in the report there's support from the town council, but that is subject to them saying that they uh, want lighter materials to the building to make it, it will reduce its or make it appear less tall. They've got concerns about a balconies encroachment to the front, which I'll mention. Uh, they would, they're, they're concerned about the lack of any environmental credentials to the building. 
uh, noise uh, opening hours for the restaurant, uh, concerns of car parking, uh, which I'll show you in a minute, and concerns that there are um, some rooms within uh, some of the residential dwellings that don't have any, have any windows or natural ventilation. You'll also see them from the report that there's quite considerable uh, representation from third parties. So 78 letters have come in, uh, uh, some neutral, 51 in support, 22 objections. Those in support mainly uh, are understandably, uh, and we agree with this, uh, supportive of the redevelopment uh, of the site and bringing the business back into use and regenerating this part of the seafront. Uh, those that are objecting to it are, are saying that the buildings of a poor design uh, and it's too tall and raise concerns about loss of privacy. And I think those comments sort of reflect uh, what I'm going to go through here and what's in the in the report. So, um, as I said, this, we're, we're on the esplanade here. So we've got commercial uses then we've got residential around. Um, if I just go forward to the end. So this is the uh, so off the road to the rear through these properties, there's an access, narrow access way that would lead down to uh, the lower ground floor where there'd be the parking area. And you can see bin store and cycle store, et cetera, that would be proposed. And then we go up a floor, uh, to, which is the sort of ground level to the frontage of the site, if you like. So the front is a floor higher than the rear. And there you can see that we've got a restaurant area which covers the footprint of uh, where the, the pub or most of the pub is at the, at the moment. And then we go up to a further three floors, uh, three residential properties on each of the floors. Uh, and there's a stair courts and a lift at the uh, stairways and a lift at the rear to access them. Um, I'm sorry this isn't very clear, but you might be able to make out just here, for example, there's one of the rooms that doesn't have any light uh, on natural ventilation, and that's copied across on these floor plans. And here, uh, it's like uh, they're shown a study stroke third bedrooms to the to the property. Um, and then we get to the to the roof plan, so you can see the the, the pictures there. And and here we are in elevation form. Um, so you can see the scale above the scale of the adjoining properties here, particularly in relation to this unit. So when I come onto the photos, if members want to make reference to the scale of these, the height of these buildings, and then they'll be able to see that we are a full floor and a bit above the height of the existing building and above the height of these surrounding properties. And you can see that that um, it also extends slightly further to the east here and then you can see we get these uh this large blank dark uh wall in the dark brick as we've got dark brick here and then we've got the lighter brick in between and to the lift shaft at the rear and this is the rear elevation so you can see um the steps up at, at the back and then the lift shaft in contrast in brick color and you can see the windows there to the rear of the flats and side on, uh, you can see the profile of the adjoining building. So you can see how much larger the building is than the, than the adjoining buildings. And you can also see from this the scale of the projection forward and how it overhangs the pavement here, which I'll also uh, mention in a minute because it's a key part of the report. Uh, and there are your cross sections. So again, you can see here the overhang uh, to the front. Uh, and again, that shows the relationships to the properties to the rear, which I'll show a photo of. So to the rear at the upper, the lower ground, there's commercial, but at the upper floor, there's a number of flats that all look into this uh, tight area here. Uh, and this cross section leads down to the esplanade, cross the road and then onto the onto the beach. Uh, so, again, the elevations that, that that I've shown. So it's this building here that is the application site. So you can see the sign of the hook and para, the rendered building and this blue gable. So you can see how the building uh, relates to the existing buildings along the seafront and the scale of it. Um, and you, uh, so there we go. So um, is, is this property here, you can see that it's in need of some, some investment, um, but in terms of the, uh, the proposed building, I've, I make members aware of the ridge level of this property and the ridge level of this property. And then if I go back to the elevations, oh, there we go, you can see how much taller this building is than the adjoining property to either side. So a, a full floor, plus projecting back further, plus coming forward uh, of the existing building. So uh, if you imagine it's going to project forward and hang over the pavement area here. 
and it's almost also proposed to fill in half of this gap between these two properties so coming a further two meters to the to the east uh, so that's a better photo so if you can imagine it's going to come right up to the boundary here um, and there's a wider view looking back down so the buildings uh, the, the hook and parrot pub is in here so you'd be able to view the building uh, above uh, that uh, the what's there at the moment uh, and then from the car park at the rear so this is the rear this is the building that's proposed to be uh, demolished and rebuilt so we get a much taller building put back in its place and this is that court uh, yard area to the rear so this is where a ground floor level where the parking would be at the undercroft lower here and then the building would raise up and you would have the windows uh, facing these windows of these existing properties in this very tight knit area um, so I did mention the issue with the red line and the overhang. Um, so the, the red line submitted with a plan application is incorrect, um, as in it doesn't show the whole of the site. It stops short of the overhang of the building. Um, so you can see the red line here. So it doesn't, the applicant doesn't own the land that these parts of the building overhang. Uh, and that's quite serious because obviously the, whoever is the owner of that land might not be aware that this plan and application has been submitted. Mm. Um, it might be Devon County owned land. Uh, we're not sure. But the purpose of the red line is for the applicant to complete the correct certificates and go out to consultation so that anybody that might have ownership of that land or might be affected and have an interest in it has got an opportunity to comment. Um, so that's that part of the application uh, is at fault and needs to be amended. Um, uh, so if members were to uh, want to approve planning permission, then I'd strongly recommend that the application be reconsulted to correct that deficit, to make sure that everybody who might have an interest in that piece of land is aware or can provide comment on it. Or it might be that the owner might not want to allow that, that, that extent of overhang to happen. Um, go moving on to the report. The, the building's been vacant, uh, well, I was going to say since lockdown, but before lockdown, the, the, the pub was in quite a rundown way. Uh, lack of investment wasn't really very well used by the residents of Seaton. Um, and the site is in the Seaton conservation area. So in terms of the principle of development, it's in the built-up area boundaries, so the principle of development is acceptable. Uh, it's in the town centre as well, uh, so obviously we'd want to support, uh, support regeneration of the town centre and, and investment. There's the loss of the public house, but they're proposing to put this, uh, this, this, this restaurant area back at ground floor, uh, and you can see the design of that, so it's sort of a, a more than a floor, sort of out of keeping with these floor level of these adjoining properties. Um, but in terms of uh, the loss of the pub, bringing the restaurant back in, it's going to employ similar people, be of a similar use. So we are supportive of the investment in, that that would bring. So in general, we're supportive of some redevelopment or investment and refurbishment of the site and the benefits that that, that, that could bring about. But you'll see from the report that it then goes on to talk about the impact on the character appearance of the conservation area. And obviously, uh, members need to give special regard to preserving you know, to the conservation area and need to make sure that proposals either preserve or enhance uh, the character and appearance of the conservation area. Uh, or if there is harm, then there needs to be uh, public benefits that outweigh that. You'll see in the report that the existing building uh, on there is one of the, uh, was one of the first buildings on the seafront. It dates back to about the 1880s. Uh, it's not listed and it's not a key building in the conservation area, but you can see from the photos that it is a key site and a key, key, uh, a key location. The, rebuild, the building, whilst in need of some, some uh, investment, it does retain features identifying it as Victorian. So the layout, the roof form and the fenestration and materials. Um, um, there's no evidence with the application that the applicants considered a refurbishment. Uh, and that and a refurbishment of the building or even refurbishment and sub-extension or changes couldn't create the same benefits that are being provided through the restaurant, restaurant and the reinvestment in the, in the site. You'll also see from the photos that most of the, uh, the buildings here are sort of rendered or pebble dashed. Uh, the application proposes the use of um, dark brick uh, as I mentioned here, particularly to the rear, you can see the dark brick and then the light contrasting brick for the shift, uh, the lift shaft and the dark bricks here around the balcony. And that's considered to be uh, out of character with the area. 
uh, alongside that concern about the materials is the concern about the, the height. Um, it is, uh, as I say, uh, over a full floor higher than the existing property on the site, which is about this height. You can see the vast difference between in the height between this part of the building and, and this part. And again here, and the fact that you project forward of the existing building quite substantially and backwards, and you have this very large mass of dark materials to the side of, of this building. Uh, so when you look at the, at the photos here, um, you know, the, the, the proposed building is going to be up at this height up here and, and dwarf these adjoining buildings. Um, and that's considered to be out of context and character with the conservation area. So there's concerns that you will see in the report from the conservation officer and the urban design officer supportive of redevelopment and the investment, but uh, objecting to the materials and the scale and design of the proposal as it's out of keeping with the area and harmful to the to the conservation area. The applicants put forward some public benefits that believes that that outweighs uh, any harm or impact on the conservation area. That's bringing the site back into use, the jobs created from construction and the restaurant and the wider spend ongoing from the restaurant on the flats and the small number of additional homes. Uh, but you'll see in the report in response to that, uh, with, 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 with no information about why the building can't be refurbished or no information on viability, um, we've got nothing but before us at the moment that wouldn't say that a refurbishment of this building or a proposal with three floors less wouldn't provide the same or similar public benefits uh, without or wider economic benefits without causing harm to the conservation area. You'll see in the report that flood risk issues have been concerned. You might be able to see from this photo that the floor levels are raised above, uh, above the ground here. So although this photo is taken beyond the seawall, the Environment Agency are now happy there's no uh, risk of flooding and county highways are happy with the access to the rear and the parking court. Uh, in terms of amenity impacts, it goes into quite a, a lot of detail of that in the report. Um, so to the west of the site here, we've, we, we've got this building, um, cafe at ground floor, residential above, uh, much smaller building. And there's a concern that by the building projecting forward, um, if I can find the right. Yeah, there we go. By this building projecting forward of this building and the, the mass and height of it, plus the dark materials, there's a concern that's going to have an impact on that, on the amenity of that property and their, and their balcony and overbearing oppressive impact. Uh, to the north of the site uh, is that courtyard area um, here to the rear. And again, there's a concern that increasing the number of windows, having those walkways uh, at the back and a much taller building is going to create even a, a worse relationship with these residential windows. Uh, at very tight distances, some only about five metres. And whilst it's tight knit at the moment and not a particularly uh, inviting environment, it would be made worse by the, by the proposal given its increased bulk and the additional floor. And to the east of the site, um, over here, we've got this property. You can see that there are uh, secondary windows in the side and balconies, and the building's gonna come two meters close to the boundary. So again, there's a concern about the oppressive impact of, uh, of this scale of building and the windows in relation to, well, you can see the scale of the property there. Um, so there's amenity concerns, and there's been no assessment of that in the design and access statement or, or, or mention of impact on neighboring properties. Uh, the count, the, the, there's no green credentials really mentioned in the application following on from the town council's comments. There is mention of using solar panels, but there's, there's, no, there's nothing on the elevations to, to reflect that. So in conclusion, there's concerns from the town council about the materials, the conservation officer and urban design officer are concerned about the height and the materials. Um, I don't feel the, the loss of the existing building has been justified and why there can't be benefits from uh, refurbishing or extending the existing building. But regardless of that, the proposal that's before us uh, is considered to cause harm to the conservation area by reason of its materials and the extra floor that's going onto the building, that's considered to be harmful to the conservation area um, and not out and that, that harm isn't outweighed by the public benefits, which I say we, we think could be achieved through a, a floor less or even refurbishment or extension of the existing building. And there's also concern about the impact on the immunity of the residents to the rear and the side from the scale of building proposed. So uh, in light of that, the application is uh, recommended for refusal. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Rose. Um, I wonder if you could <laughs> confirm, I think I know what the urban designer means, but he, he's used a rather colorful term here. Um, he said the nearest, the seven story tower was designed in the seventies to reflect its seaside location by being the architectural equivalent of a bag of smashed crabs. <laughs> He's, he's got very colourful language, I know. Yes. He's, he's relating to this 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 That's horrible right. block on the seafront down here, yeah. which well, I, I don't, it's, uh, some members that have been on committee for a number of years might recall that there was a, a proposal put forward quite a number of years ago that going consent for refurbing and extending this building to try and uh, try and improve its appearance. Um, yeah. But yes. Yeah. OK, thank you. I find that a bit amusing. Um, right. Um, Robin Upton. The agent, I see you're in the meeting. You have three minutes. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Robin Upton, planning consultant, speaking on behalf of the applicant. I hope you can all hear me. Um, it's a shame that the application has been recommended for refusal, as we'd have liked to have worked further with officers to address their concerns. But the application has been uh, reported to committee uh, without our asking. There are a lot of positives brought about by the development and overwhelming support by the parish council community. There are no technical concerns from the likes of highways, environmental health, the county archaeologists, contaminated land, flood risk and the environment agency. As stated in the committee report, there are 51 letters of public support for the development. One supporting comment to me sums up the general feeling of support which states that the current building is an embarrassment to the town. The only concerns are from the council's conservation officer and urban design officers who, despite the public sentiment towards the building, have attributed significant weight to the architectural and historic merits of the building. We consider that these officers are starting from the wrong position. We have asked these officers to come and view the building to see for themselves that the building has degraded beyond viable repair or refurbishment. We have submitted a structural assessment of the building confirming this, but officers haven't taken the poor condition of the building into account, as you've heard from Mr. Rose. It's perfectly safe from a COVID perspective to visit the building unaccompanied if required, but officers have declined to do so. It is obvious to anyone that has visited the site that the existing building should not be afforded the sentiment that officers attribute to the building. I also point out that it's not a listed building. <coughs> existing building cannot be avoided and therefore to state that its loss represents substantial harm is I'm afraid politely very wide of the mark. If officers accepted the loss of the building which most people see as a positive not a negative the recommendation before you might be somewhat different. Turning to design the main issue seems to be the fact that the proposed building is taller than the existing building and a bit wider. The scheme would however be uh, partially concealed in longer range uh, oblique views along the seafront as a result of which adverse effects of the scheme would be localised to close range views from directly in front of the building. Use of brick seems to be of concern, however brick is common within the conservation area and favoured compared uh, to render that doesn't survive well in marine environments. If the proposed brick uh, isn't uh, preferred... 30 seconds left. Thank you. A condition could be imposed to seek alternative lighter colour materials and we could uh, discuss those with officers. It's our view that the proposal represents a much needed improvement to the contribution of, of the site uh, that would provide high quality restaurant flats. Chair and committee, if you feel you can't support the development before you, we request uh, a, a deferment to uh, address some of the issues which officers have uh, not let us have the opportunity to do so. They haven't um, uh, said that we can uh, submit any further amended material, but we would like to uh, do that if, if, if the committee can't support this current uh, uh, scheme before them. Uh, and we can include environmental credentials and, and, and anything else that, that's required. Uh, but they can also be conditioned in any event should, should members feel that this application is accepted. Fine. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Upton. Um, could you um, perhaps answer Mr. Rose's point about the overhang, please, and the ownership of the land and whether the owner is aware? Um, this is the first time that that we've been, uh, this has been made aware. Uh, so 
Uh, I can't answer that question. Um, and again, it's you know, as I've sort of hinted in in, in the conversations, we've we've officers haven't let us address any of these points, and and, and I think it's somewhat unfair that uh, without any prior warning, this issue has been raised. But um, it's something that we could uh, investigate um, and 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 get to the bottom of and rectify. You know, if the committee resolved to uh, uh, approve this this application, as Mr. Rose suggested, we could um, we can investigate the ownership uh, and and consult on on any owners that haven't been notified, so that they are fully aware. And assuming that there's no further issues raised, then um, potentially the, the application uh, could be approved. Thank you. I would have thought that that would have been done at the outset if you're going to be building so they overhang somebody else's land, you would make them aware first. I might be wrong on that. Um, right, the ward members now. Councillor Hartnell, you have five minutes. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a, a brief bit of history on this site. Uh, I became involved uh, with the previous owners of, of the Hook and Parrot, a company called Trust In, back in... 2018, 2019, and um, challenged them over the poor condition of the building and lack of investment. Um, the, the pressure that was, was subsequently put onto them actually led to them selling the property and actually bringing it forward for much needed redevelopment. Um, I'm a little bit frustrated, to be honest with you, um, over how this particular application has been handled because the, um, the applicants, as I understand it, have requested um, that both the conservation officer and planning officers could attend site to actually look at the internal uh, issues that the building faces. And I refer to the uh, structural report that um, was submitted on the 22nd of July, which re refers to movement and damage to masonry, decay to timber structures, damp and deteriorating mortar, and it also refers to many areas of the building that are past the point of economic repair. Um, so I fully accept that there is uh, some harm from the development, uh, certainly the over, over um, bearing nature of the uh, proposed development could be perceived as harm, but it is my view that um, on balance, the economic and public benefit to to Seaton through this being redeveloped is much, much greater. Um, the building has been a blot on the landscape for many years and it is in such a prime location um, and it currently has no special architectural or historical value and that actually anybody that was inspecting it internally would see this. Um, I think the design and access statement um, in particular uh, addresses um, the public and economic benefits um, and I think overall, on balance, um, the improvement and enhancement to the seafront and the vitality of the town centre way um, uh, over comes the issues of, of harm. So um, there is a little bit of frustration here and because, like I say, I, I don't feel the applicants have been treated completely fairly. Um, but on balance, I do support the application. I would hope some of the issues raised could be addressed by um, by implementing some conditions. Um, so I, I do support the application and I hope the committee will, will consider um, perhaps uh, some conditions so that this, this uh, uh, development can proceed with, with speed because um, it's much needed for seat and seat front for regeneration and for enhancement and vitality of the local economy. I'd very much like to see this uh, development moving forward and, and open to the public next year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you, Councillor Hartnell. I'd like to go to Mr. Rose because there seems to be some criticism uh, about the planning process. Mr. Rose, could you um, maybe address those concerns, please? Yeah. Yes, thank you, Chair. Yeah, we. Uh, it's fair to say we 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 have um, we haven't engaged with the applicant on this application. The reason being that they submitted a pre-app to us. Uh, and we gave our response to the pre-app and that hasn't really been taken into account. Um, so we've got an application that doesn't depart from the pre-app that we commented on. Our view also is that there's significant change needed to the application. It, it, we don't feel it's just a change in materials, it's a change in the design approach and the height of the building and that that requires a new application. 
And we might normally negotiate on some of those things, but um, and we're more than happy to work with the applicant because I do agree uh, with a lot of what Councillor Hartnell saying about the benefits of, of getting the restaurant in and, and um, you know, redeveloping the site and the benefits to the seafront. But we've also got this issue with the red line. We've, we've, got, an, we've got an overhang here on somebody else's land who isn't aware of that application, might not support the application. It, it might have an impact on viability. Um, so, uh, and also, um, and I apologize to the agent if this isn't right, but uh, I was aware that the, the, the changes that they were seeking to make were to reduce the height by 600 millimeters and that, that really wasn't gonna make uh, any difference to us. So for those reasons, we have put the application uh, on the agenda uh, recommending uh, refusal. Um, as I say, more than happy to work with the applicant outside of, outside of this to, um, or, or even as part of this as members defer, uh, to, to see if we can approve the, you know, get to a, a position. In terms of the existing building and viability, yes, we've had a structural report, but that, that doesn't necessarily in itself mean, and we haven't got the evidence that, uh, that there isn't something that could be done with the existing building to make it viable, or probably more to the point, why you know the officers have identified this harm from this additional floor is that additional floor needed in viability terms given the 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 harm that this is going to cause in officers views to the conservation area so i think we a number of issues there uh, as to why we haven't negotiated on this application because there's, there's a lot of issues that we feel still need to be resolved thank you thank you very much mr rose that is helpful i'm sure members will find that helpful um Councillor Ledger, you have five minutes. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I, I won't go over much the Councillor um, Hartnell's way, so I'll, I'll change it slightly. Um, there's just a couple of, well, a few points I wish to make. So in the start under, in the report under conservation, um, it talks about sash windows and the need to retain these but as you can see from the the photos uh shown to all members they are all upvc um what are we trying to retain in those photos to the rear of the building yes there are still some sash windows but they can't be viewed or seen by the public um when it comes to uh, the scale of the building um if uh, any of the members are on the strategic planning committee um, it's already been put forward for the, the new local plan that we don't have the necessary urban capacity in our town centres. So what we will be looking to is to increase density within our town centres by building up. Um, yes, this is slightly ahead of the curve and it's not, it's not current policy, but that is the way that I believe E7 will be going in the future. Um, if we are again looking at scale, we can, if um, Mr. Rose can go to some previous photos, looking next to uh, the set of flats, which is six stories, which is three buildings along. Um, if you look a little bit further down the, um, down the street and the seafront, you'll find another set of flats, which is six stories high. And then even further down there, there's the new seat and beach development, which again, um, is a full story higher than any building surrounding it. Um, I know that we are supposed to take uh, planning applications on its own merit and individually, but taking the landscape of the seat and seafront, it, it won't it, it won't be out of place because of so many other buildings that have done it um, already. Um, and then finally, just the, when we look at the the investment that it's going to bring to the town, um, it's been much needed for a very long time. Um, and I'm glad to see someone actually looking into Seaton to actually put in a serious amount of um, investment into the town, um, both economically and um, for the viability, really. Um, what I would like to see is um, the, the subsoil, <coughs> actually, of the, the overhang, the subsoil is owned by itself. Um, I know that through um, other discussions, through other matters. So it is actually E7 uh, owned the subsoil that, of the overhang. Um, what I'd like to see is obviously approval subject to the amendments listed by Mr Rose and uh, possibly a condition to use a lighter brick colour if possible. Um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Ledger. Um, I have a question. Um, the impact and the overbearing nature of 
uh, the proposed application has been um, commented on. The other buildings, which are several stories high, do they have an impact on adjacent or adjoining buildings, please? Mr. Rose, could you answer that? Uh, thank you. Yeah. So well, I suppose the first thing to say about those other buildings is they're outside of the conservation area. So there's a yeah. big difference there. Uh, yes, they are of a larger scale. Um, that one in the picture certainly isn't isn't pretty. And I wouldn't want to be using that as a sort of example of something we should be copying. Um, but that's outside of the conservation area. And we need to give, um, you know, special regard to schemes in the conservation area. This yeah. block, there's quite a considerable distance here between these two. So there's not the same uh, harm on the adjoining properties and yes the, the Seaton Beach one further down isn't isn't as tight-knit a location as, as as this doesn't have those properties so close to the rear so I don't think they're comparable. Thank you very much that that answers that question because not being familiar with the area um, it, it's um, it's difficult to gauge. Um, Councillor Rowland. Thank you chair and um... I'll try not to repeat too much uh, what's been said by my fellow ward uh, members. Um, I accept that the proposed development sits within the conservation area and that the conservation officer is concerned that the demolition of the existing building will be a loss of architectural and community value as a traditional Victorian building. However, the planning committee of Seton Town Council has not raised concerns in principle supported the application with some suggested changes that I also support. The officer recommendation to refuse is very largely based on the conservation report. In Seaton, that conservation bird flew some time ago as there has been no consistency applied in the area over many years. That is up to, to try and make a claim that two wrongs make a right, but in my opinion, to say that the current building is of any architectural merit is, in my opinion, questionable. Just because a building dates from the Victorian period does not immediately imbue it with merit, as those of you that are familiar with the site would surely agree. Within a stone's throw, as you can see from the photographs, although they're outside the conservation area, there are other buildings dating from the 60s and 70s that could be and are in the in the, uh, scope of being redeveloped in the not too distant future, hopefully, along with a redundant EDC toilet block that is even just a bit further along from that 1970s uh, block that you can see in that photograph. In addition, there is a seafront enhancement scheme that is still very much on the cards as a proposed development that would take into account pedestrianising the road that you can see in that photo and levelling out and making access to the beach um, very much a better prospect and, and vision from the businesses along that uh, seafront area that you can see in that photograph. Um, the business that is being proposed there would be of tremendous benefit to this area, um, different in nature from the pub that... Uh, did exist in this area, but certainly a welcome addition and would be very much a, an economic driver uh, to bring in more people to this particular area. Seton has been subject to um, a checkered history as, in terms of its overall regeneration uh, following the closure of the holiday camps. And tourism is a major part of the economy desperately needs investment and upgrading in a number of areas, including very much this area that you can see in that photograph. As a result, in view of the other development proposals in this vicinity, I would ask the committee to take these into account when considering the application and that seat and seafront really does need investment, both public and private, to attract tourists and repeat visitors. So I would urge the committee to take these into account and also to take into account the uh, conditions that could be applied, because I agree about the uh, brickwork that's been uh, proposed in this site does need revision. Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you, Councillor Rowland. Um, could I go to Mrs Shaw now? Mrs Shaw, it's been um, commented on that the overhang would hang over East Devon District Council owned land. Um, could I take some advice on that, please? Yes, um, I think for members to um, consider this application, I think it would be better if the application was deferred so that we could clarify this um, overhang issue, mainly because we need to ensure that there's no bias uh, in the consideration of this matter. And if, if as Councillor uh, Ledger has asserted, we do have an interest in the land, then I think it, it would be better to defer it at this point and then bring it back once this, is, this is issue has been clarified. But it's for I, you, Chair, to, to make that decision. That's what yeah. Um, I think in the light of that and in the interest of probity that we should defer this. Now, would this need a proposal um, or can we just defer it? Um, I think, <coughs> Chair, if you were to, to move the deferral from the Chair, um, yes, that... then uh, there would not necessarily be a need for a seconder. Um, no. Okay, then I so move um, that we defer this until we have more information. As a, as a point, Madam Chair, could I just add to that? Yeah. I think by not allowing the debate to take place, it's not really fair in the way that we're going forward. What I would suggest is, is that, uh, if I may, uh, what I suggest is, is that we have the discussion so as to get the feel as to where people are uh, members and then we can see where where we're going because I say this um, in the way of our processing going forward because if I were the applicant I'd be a bit miffed if it was almost almost all sorted out the fact of the matter is anybody in law in planning law and Mr Rose will know this and please Mr Rose if I got it wrong put me right can make a planning application on anybody else's land anywhere and that, actually, all that that means is in planning law, you may get the planning, but of course, if that particular person who owns the land don't want to give it up, then you probably won't be able to implicate that particular planning application. I think I'm correct in saying that. Secondly, I actually think that there are, a, I actually, a, in principle, I'm agreeing with the officer recommendation of refusal. And the reason I'm saying that is there are so many inconsistencies within this application that, that a deferral to me is just kicking the kicking it down the road but there are many other things i want to say which i'm not being given the opportunity to say but deferral would not be one that i would be supporting i just say that just to get out there because i would like to have the debate but if other if you feel madam chair or other members feel that they you know i'd like to really get the debate and i think what the debate will also do it will give a steer to the planning officers in as they go forward with the deferral, if, 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 if certainly that's what it's, it ends up in, then at least they've got a steer from this committee about the sort of direction of travel from where we are and the applicants as well, which is far better, in my view, while we're all here now in this process, just going for a deferral and then it all lands because we want to know whether or not who owns the land and who doesn't. It is irrelevant to who own the land in planning law it's just that that agreement would have to be got with those particular the, the landowner and whether that landowner wanted to sell that land or do a deal or not is up to them but that's to me putting that out on that basis it's really quite weak and I, it's not something i think is proper propriety as you spoke about earlier thank you thank you um well may i come back on that chair yes if, if it would can. assist I, I can see I can see the logic in Councillor Skinner's um, yeah. comments, um, and if that was your approach and the committee's approach, then the recommendation could not be to approve to the senior officer. It would just be that it would be note the debate would be noted in that respect. Yeah, I think we've had this argument before, haven't we, once before, when um, it was debated and when it came back to committee, it couldn't be debated um Madam I'm chair may i may i interrupt i'm terribly sorry but there is a note on the chat line on on the zoom 
um, from Robin Upton, who was the public speaker earlier, saying, I am advised by the applicant that they have met with the county council who own the overhang land and that they are happy. I don't know whether everybody's seen that, but I mean, there's, 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 there's no, nothing in writing from the county council to no, say they're happy, but I, I, think, I just I sort of put think, that in. I thank you. I've just seen that note, um, but Mr Upton was unaware who owned the land when, when I asked him the question. So in view of that, um, I think to play safe, um, if that's the right expression, uh, this item will be deferred for further information to come to light, and especially as there may be a payment involved. Chair, Thank can I members. just... Chair, I've had um, my hand up for a while, so can I just make a comment on that? That's yeah, who support. is that, Jeff Pook? It is, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, I'm quite well. The actual the applicant actually um, offered to defer at one point. Whether it's deferral or withdrawal and resubmission, I don't know. But there are, yeah, you know, there's no argument about the need to do something, and I don't think there's any argument about the, the the retaining of the building. But there are significant things apart from just the overhang which need to be sorted out um, you know, with the planners. And if they haven't had full full dialogue with them, then then let's have a, an application come before us that where they have had full dialogue because. I do think it's um, it, it's high and it's imposing, but on the other hand, I appreciate things that Councillor Ledger said. So it's almost like the application with the, the red line issues and the, the supposed lack of dialogue and, and lack of, uh, of real, real understanding, viability. It's come to us in, a, in, a, in an immature state and it really needs to come back. Um, having proper proper liaison with the planners and and recognition of this um, feeling that it is overbearing um, and it needs and it needs to sort of uh, to fit in with the uh, with the area. So yeah. not only not only to come back because of the red line, but also we want them to actually start looking at the, you know, the design in a bit more, a bit more detail. Yeah, well, just 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 a reminder that there was a pre application advice given and that wasn't heeded councillor pook so they did have a chance um sorry no. i wasn't saying they didn't have a chance but i think no. you know they need okay. to they need to do it to base it now right well um i'm told now that we need a vote on the deferral so i'm proposing we defer this um do i have a seconder please happy to second chair thank Council you councillor Bizarum. can we um Take a vote on this then, please. Yes, certainly, Chair. Councillor Bloxham. Yes, support deferral. Councillor Brown. Support deferral. Councillor Chamberlain. Support deferral. Councillor Davy. Uh, I don't support deferral. I feel we should have the discussion and <clears throat> they come back with a different application, really, but... I'll, I'll go along with it. Okay, so, sorry, Councillor Davy, was you against deferral? I or? am against deferral, actually. Yeah. Lovely, thank you. Councillor Desarum? Yes, absolutely, Sup support deferral. Councillor Gazard? Support deferral. Councillor Key? Against deferral. Councillor Lawrence? Against deferral. Councillor Pook. Support deferral, providing it's, it's all not just looking at the red line, it's looking at all issues. Councillor Pratt. Councillor yes, Pratt. Um, yes, sorry. Um, I, I think I'll follow what uh, Councillor Pook has just said. Um, there's a lot more that could be done here, but... Uh, Refusal um, would be the best way forward, in my view. But uh, the the uh, applicant does need to look at various things which are in these reports. There's a lot of work still to do on this site, and uh, it's not just a case of the a deferral. Uh, I think there should be a refusal. But anyway, uh, I'll go along with the matter. But uh, there's a lot to be done here. Um, so I've got no objection to the matter. Thank uh, you, thank you, Councillor Pratt. I think you made your views known. Thank you. Um, thank you. <laughs> so, 
sorry, so I can confirm that was uh, support for deferral? Yes. Thank you. Councillor Skinner? Against support for deferral. Councillor Woodward has left the, mil uh, the meeting and sent his apologies for the remainder. So, um, and then uh, finally, it's Councillor Rag. Support deferral. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in support of deferral and one, two, three, four against. So I can advise the application is recommended for deferral. Thank you. Um, now, members, would you like a comfort break? About 15 minutes, come back at one o'clock. Okay. Okay. If I could ask members just to um, mute their microphones um, and turn off their cameras for the 15 minutes because the live stream will remain running. Thank you, Wendy. Back at one o'clock then.
Right, Wendy, are we all back? Would you like to do a roll call just to make uh, sure yes, that I everyone think... is back? Yes, please. Okay, so I'll um, I'll start with you, Chair. Yes, I'm back. Councillor Chamberlain. Present. Thank you. Councillor Bloxham. Present. Councillor Brown. Present. Councillor Davy. Present. Councillor Dasaran. Present. Thank you, Wendy. Councillor Gazard. Present. <clears throat> Councillor Key. Present, Wendy. Councillor Lawrence. Present. Thank you. Councillor Pook. Present till about 2.15. Thank you, 2.15. Councillor Pratt. Present. Councillor Skinner. I'll come back to Councillor Skinner. So we've received apologies from Councillor Whibley, Councillor Woodward um, and Councillor Wright. So it's just uh, Councillor Skinner. Thank you. Okay, so I will, um, hopefully he should be returning. I haven't received apologies for this afternoon, so I'll um, uh, maybe come back to him. Shall we give him another minute, <clears throat> perhaps? In the meantime, Wendy, can I just point out the recording is still paused. Oh, thank you. Right, let's have a look. Councillor Skinner, are you with us? He's he's in the meeting, but obviously he's muted and his camera is off. So um, uh, um, unless something has popped up, um, I'm not sure what to say with Councillor Skinner. Well, we, if you are there, Councillor Skinner, can you switch on, please? Um, because if we hear an application and we start it and you're not there, you won't be able to vote. No, still not there. So um, we start the meeting then, I think. Agenda item 12, application 21-1402, variation minor, unit five, Western Park, Devonshire Road, Heath Park, Industrial Estate, Honiton, pages 67 to 76. Um, and welcome to the meeting to Mr. Lowry and the ward member, um, Councillor Allen. So, um, Chris, can you present your report, please? Thank you, Chair. Uh, firstly, apologies, because just notice on the, uh, on the agenda, it's got the, the wrong building uh, located as Unit 5. It's, show, it's a building shown in red, but actually the building relates to the application relates to the building immediately south of the property you could see on that on that agenda front sheet called the squirrels. Um, oh. So if I just uh, so, yeah, the, the, the property in red on the application is this one here, but actually it relates to the building that's on the boundary here with these two uh, these two properties here. So apologies for that. I've only just spotted it. So next to this property, Oak Dean, there's a there's a there's a building in here and it relates to to that building. So this is a variation of condition application. It's a, it's a gym at the moment and they want to extend their opening hours. So currently they're open from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Monday to Fridays and 8 till 6 on Saturdays, Sundays, bank holidays. And they want to extend that to 24 hours uh, a week. This is the uh, existing building. So very industrial in nature at the front and at the rear, there's a window and, and an emergency staircase and it's laid out internally as a gym. It'll probably be clearer to you from the aerial. There we go. So it relates to this building here. So you come in off the main estate, park to the front, access door in here, and that fire escape and window to the rear. And you can see uh, the landscape into the edge of the site and the relationship to the surrounding properties 
uh, and I believe Mr. Lowry's property up here. Uh, and if I just move on with the, uh, oh, come on. Come on, just move on with the photos. Sorry, my computer's frozen. Let me carry on while they're loading. So you'll see in the report that the environmental health officer has recommended approval, but subject to a noise management plan. Uh, so they, they are uh, saying that they want a noise management plan in place that uh, controls the audio from the uh, equipment, the music equipment that's used in the building. Uh, so they want a limiting device on that. They want to make sure all doors are shut when those activities are taking place. Notices in the car park and the building. And then the condition to further say that if those measures aren't successful, uh, that uh, there are either further measures put in place or, or, or we re revisit what else they can do. So the main issue to the uh, application relates to... Um, main issue to the application relates to the amenity impact on the neighbours uh, and the applicants saying that they need the proposal to meet customer demand because uh, there's changed working patterns and shifts that, that people have uh, undertaken now that their com competitors aren't uh, restricted in terms of the hours that they can offer and that they've got CCTV panic alarms and fully manned outsourced surveillance uh, that they can that they can rely on. As I say, and the environmental health officer has, raised, has said there's been no complaints received about the operation of the building, although I don't too take into account the views of the, the surrounding residents who are concerned uh, and have written in and said that they, they've been disrupted previously by the playing of music. I think when there's been gym classes on uh, and particularly music with, a, with, with a, uh, a, a bass, although obviously during lockdown they, were, um, that they weren't experiencing those, any of those issues. So I'm aware of those neighbour concerns, as is the environmental health officer, but the environmental health officer believes that those any impacts from noise can be mitigated via the condition in the report um, to control the noise uh, uh, through that condition. So no audio uh, limiting device and then further mitigation measures if, if further complaints are received. So. Given the uh, support from the environmental health officer subject to that condition, uh, we're recommending approval um, subject to conditions. Uh, sorry, my screen has froze, but if I were able to move on, you'll see that there's photos uh, to the rear of the building here and there's quite a large landscaping belt to both sides uh, are, are surrounding the building. Uh, but I do appreciate that there's quite close relationship to the surrounding properties, uh, hence that condition from environmental health but subject to that condition it's recommended for approval thank you thank you um now i'd like to ask um mrs shaw please um councillor skinner came in after that presentation started i don't know how far in um could you advise please the um the reason for knowing when Councillor Skinner came in is to whether he heard the whole of Chris Rose's presentation. If he didn't, yeah. then he could. it would be very difficult for him to understand the matter and uh, be able to debate and vote on it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Shirley. Um, Councillor Skinner? No, I didn't hear all of uh, Mr. Rose's uh, comments, so I was delayed and I didn't realise the time. So I missed the first part, so I think it better if I don't comment or, or vote, I think, on this particular occasion. Yeah. That's best. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's, that's prudent. Thank you. Um, right, then we go to Mr. Ray Lowry, please. You have three minutes to speak and welcome to the meeting. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Ray Lowry. I live at the, the Squirrels. Uh, it's one of the nine neighbouring bungalows uh, to the gym. Uh, I wish to speak both in support and against the application. I know it's a bit controversial, but uh, I mainly support the, uh, the, the application. Uh, my concerns are, as one of the neighbours, uh, with the noise and the bass of the music, uh, if it was 24-7, uh, this, this could become a problem um, if... The, the gyms allowing their, their, uh, their users to, uh, to just turn the music up whenever they want. We've just heard that there's going to be, oh, there's a proposal to put a, uh, 
a noise management plan in place, that would be great. Uh, if the gym stays open 24 seven and the members have access to the sound system, I can foresee this being a problem if there's not something in place. Uh, for, for the, uh, the, the transport, the traffic, uh, the parking, I can't see any problems there. There's never any noise from them, they're great. Uh, however, I was concerned to read on the initial application that B Fitness didn't have a single complaint about noise since opening in three years. I myself have made a complaint because of this heavy bass on a Saturday morning. And on reading that, there was also uh, two other members, uh, sorry, two other uh, residents who live here who also have on a number of occasions made complaints. So this, this says, uh, you know, one of two things, uh, either the staff don't put this to, towards the attention of the, uh, the owner uh, and record anything, or the owner is misleading the council when applying for this, uh, this extension uh, without actually acknowledging there have been complaints. Uh, to me, that just shows that they're unapproachable uh, with any noise complaints. So again, that reinforces the noise management plan would need to be in place. Uh, again, uh, there's only three uh, members of public who's made a comment on this application. Uh, all three were objections, all three were neighbours, uh, and uh, none of these... Uh, these uh, uh, users of the gym have uh, have uh, managed to come forward with uh, anything supporting, which uh, that's that's why I'm I'm wanting to also be in support of it because uh, as as a retired athlete, uh, I know only too well how important it is to be able to train uh, regularly during the some sometimes uh, on long shifts uh, that's late at night, early in the morning, uh, and I'm aware that uh, there's not many gyms that allow this. Somewhere like B Fitness would be great, uh, and it would be great for the community and other athletes out there if they've got somewhere like this. So I, I commend them for this, this is great. Uh, but uh, again, if you're in there individually, you don't need loud music, you've got headphones, and there's other measures in place. Uh, again, uh, the noise management plan would be great for this. Uh, uh, one final point I'd just like to mention, uh, it was on, the initial application for, for this uh, building being changed from storage to a gym. And uh, when we as a neighbor said there might be noise problems, we was kind of shut down and we was told that, uh, that this, uh, you know, being, being an industrial estate, uh, really as a residence, we should just, you know, get on with it. We should understand this noise, but this is a residential area. And that used to be a chicken farm, that site. That wasn't part of the industrial estate. And over the years that's been bought up and turned into industrial estate. They've, come on to us. We shouldn't have to abide by the industrial estate, surely the industrial estate coming on to, and it, sorry, the, the, yeah, the industrial estate coming on to a housing estate should really have to uh, be mindful of uh, those around us. Uh, in summary, I'd, uh, I'd, like to I'd like to thank you for giving me this opportunity to, uh, to talk. And uh, I, I feel the measures that uh, you've already proposed with a noise management plan is great. and. Uh, can't thank you enough for, for suggesting that. Uh, anything uh, that uh, takes into account that uh, you know noise can affect us is great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lowry. Thank um, you. Uh, you. You raised the point that, that I was going to raise, um, and I wonder whether Mr. Rose might be able to answer it, and that is the use of headphones. Um, yeah. is, is there a need for just general um, music or can it not be um, received by headphones? Yes, well, I think that's that, that, that's something that the management plan will, the noise management plan will take into account, particularly mm -hmm. in those uh, more unsociable hours, if I put it that way, uh, yeah. because there, there shouldn't be a need uh, you know, uh, I, I agree with a lot of what Mr. Lowry is saying. And, you know, there shouldn't be a need for loud music to be played in a class at 11 o'clock at night. If there are people that there will be people that want to use the gym at that time, but they can no doubt use equipment and do stuff via head, head, headphones, headset. And, and that's something that the noise management plan can pick up on. So um, could we make that a condition then if, if the committee are minded to approve? Well, I, I can make if committee are minded to approve. I can I make can make a note to make sure that, that that is included in that noise management plan. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right, Ward Member Councillor Allen, please. Thank you very much, Chair. You seem to uh, um, have a, a an issue here, really, between a very good business and nine very 
beautiful dwellings. And I don't know if you've ever been near a car going past you with low, heavy bass music, but it vibrates mm -hmm. not only through your ears, but right the way through your body as well. So I can't imagine what it would be like to live near a premises where that kind of heavy uh, music was taking place. And quite often, that's what they use to stimulate the exercise regimes. Now, the council is obviously responsible for protecting residents. And the NPPF uh, Clause 180A clearly gives you the right to refuse such a development if you feel that it's going to be of significant damage to the local residents. And I note there's no economic officer report and no evidence given by the uh, applicants as to how much um, extra work, extra time, extra income and extra use this proposal envisages. So the prime issue really uh, which is to do with policy EN14 and so on, is can the environmental health officer guarantee a noise management plan that will not affect the residents uh, in the way that we fear it might? Uh, until I've looked at such a noise management plan, I couldn't suggest approving this particular application. And I'm wondering whether this should be deferred to give the environmental health officer time to agree a noise abatement plan with the applicants. I'd rather it was deferred for that than refused. But my inclination is that nobody wants a 24 seven industrial premises emitting music for uh, disturbing local residents. That's absolutely not what we want as planning uh, members. Thank you very much for listening chair and good luck with the resolution of this particular issue. Thank you, Councillor Allen and environmental health were um, obviously invited to comment and um, they have recommended approval with conditions so I think they'll be um, fairly stringent on that. Um, right, Councillor Desarum. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chair. Um, having listened very closely to this information that we've been provided with, clearly there is an issue with the close relationships to the surrounding properties. And obviously, as Councillor Allen rightly said, we've got a very good business um, against nine, nine beautiful dwellings. Um, and I think that this is the, a, a very important decision that we're going to make about the noise. Uh, and I think that if we are going to have this, we need to discuss this clearly with the ward members so that the plan is relevant to what the ward members feel is a nuisance. But I think that as the decision is before us today, as Councillor Twist said in his report, the entrance is on Devonshire Road. I, I am mindful to propose uh, uh, supporting this to, to propose approval, but obviously we, I would like to delegate the noise management plan to the ward members to beef it up, to make sure that it's exactly what is needed, because obviously we, we don't want to uh, upset the, the residents, uh, but I do note that uh, Ray Dari was, was very supportive of the measures, provided that we control the noise, the aspect of the noise nuisance that we get. So for those reasons, I would propose approval sub subject to a ward member consultation of the noise management plan so that it, it is noise is actually kept to the absolute bare minimum. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Desarum. Is there a seconder for that? Yes, proposal? Chairman. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Key. Would you like to speak to it? Yes, I mean, you know, there, there are... Um, a lot of people, funnily enough, um, my uh, grandson, um, he knows of somebody that would love to go there, but because of his work hours, can't go there in the times that it's open. And so consequently, this would help him tremendously. 
Um, so I can't see a problem with it at all. Only I totally agree with Councillor Desarum's uh, um, point with regard to the noise issue. And uh, I know my grandson, in actual fact, he goes to um, a uh, gym and he takes his own uh, earphones with him. So uh, with uh, with music. So uh, I don't know why they don't do that rather than play uh, music at the place. But anyway, I'm more than happy to second it as long as there is very strict um, recognition of keeping the sound to an absolute minimum. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Davy. <clears throat> oh, could I please ask members, if you're not speaking, would you please mute your microphone? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I think um, there's an opportunity here by the use of conditions actually to improve things uh, for the local residents <clears throat> because I note that the noise limiting device uh, should be operated at all times when audio equipment has been used on the premises so that actually uh, would have an effect. As a, a bass player um, I fall and foul of noise limiting devices on uh, on various occasions and they're extremely effective um, but I also totally agree with the, the distance to which bass can travel um, and the, uh, the the intrusive nature of it and with that in mind I'm a bit concerned that the uh, noise management plan will only apply between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. Um, although the noise limiter would would have some effect um, I'm a bit concerned at 6 a.m. Uh, mm. I would not particularly want to be a neighbouring resident who suddenly hears bass starting up at 6am in the morning um, and I, I would like to propose that that's made 7 um, in in view of the uh, conditions for local residents. I, I appreciate they might want to run early morning classes um, but I think they probably wouldn't want to do that before 7 um, and uh, if that was acceptable to the applicants I would have suggested 7 um, rather than six, uh, and that, that's about um, the only uh, condition I would want to change. Yeah, I, I would agree with you on that. Um, is that acceptable to the proposer and seconder, please? To... Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I would agree. If, if, if yes. you're happy and other members of the committee are happy, yeah. then I'm more than happy to go along with that amendment. Thank you. Um, Councillor Gazard. No, Chair. Um, it's been said. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right, over to Mrs Shaw to sum up, please. Kent, uh, Chairman, can I, can I just actually uh, say that really there are people who go to work at 8 o'clock in the morning and would like to go at 6 o'clock to the Keep Fit. So I can't see a problem with that, really. I mean, it might be detrimental to those people that... Um, you know, want to go early in the morning. That's well, they the can thing. go, it's just that the music won't be. Oh, no, that, that's fine. Nothing wrong okay. with the music, it's just the no. opening hours. No, it's... It, um, right, Councillor Gassard, your hand is still up. Did you want to speak? Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. I, I thought that uh, Councillor Davy was suggesting that the... It would still open the normal time, but the, yeah. the music, you could use your, your earphones, so yeah. um, that that would save the noise going to the neighbours. That's how I understood it. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, Councillor Pook. Yeah, I think it's on the same thing. I'm a bit confused. Was Councillor Davy saying that the opening hours should be seven till twenty-two? No. Because it so they are so the existing opening hours are six till twenty-two. It's just the music restrictions. It's the music, okay. I think. Um, right, um, Mrs Shaw, to sum up, please. Thank you, Chair. Yes, members. So we have a motion to recommend approval subject to the conditions as listed in the report with an amendment to condition one that the um, any noise management plan so approved shall be implemented and operated during the extended hours of operation, these being at all times outside of the hours of 7 a.m. to 10 a.m., and I'm just wondering if that is actually what was intended, because... Uh, 
it's 10 p.m. 10 p.m. This is sure. 10 p.m. Uh, 2200, yeah. So yeah. that, that should read the, all times outside of the hours of 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. Monday to Fridays. And also for the local planning authority to approve that, but that also to be in consultation with ward members. If you're in support of that recommendation to approve when your name is clause called, please indicate and also indicate whether you're against the motion to recommend approval or whether you're abstaining from the vote. Thank you. Councillor Bloxham. Support approval. Councillor Brown. Sorry, support approval. Councillor Chamberlain. Support approval. Councillor Davy. Support approval with the amended condition. Councillor Desaran. Support the motion to recommend approval, subject to all the amended conditions as, as discussed. Thank you. Councillor Gazard. Support. Apologies from Councillor Howe. Um, Councillor Key. Approve. Councillor Lawrence. Support. Councillor Pook. Support approval. Councillor Pratt. Support approval. Thank you. Councillor Skinner, you're abstaining, aren't you? Yes, I'm taking no part. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Councillor Rag. Support approval. Thank you. So I can advise the application <laughs> is recommended for approval. Thank you. Right, agenda item 14, application 21, 1132, uh, full application, minor, land to the rear of Trove View, Two Bridges Road, Sidford, pages 108 to 122. Um, like to welcome Andrew Paley to the meeting, see he here? Uh, yes, I see. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Welcome to the meeting, Mr. Paley. Uh, you will have three minutes. Um, over to you, Chris Rose, to present the report. Thank you, Chair. So, yes, this is an application for construction of a detached uh, dwelling. Uh, there's a ward member objection, which is why it's before committee. The there was a proposal on here previously for two dwellings, but that's now down to one dwelling uh, and there's been a previous application to convert the main house from two fats back into one house which which has occurred and you can see here the the site at the back of the dwelling uh, with a shared access uh, to the side as and that's shown better there so the main dwelling here shared access and then we get to the development plot at the rear and there we can see the ground floor layouts quite a large footprint of dwelling with a garage garden at the back facing back towards the existing property and then the upper floor of that. Um, and we've got the elevations of the property, so quite, quite large, but quite traditional. Garage at the front, living accommodation at ground floor, uh, bedrooms above. Um, and then we've got some sections here to show the relative heights uh, back to uh, the surrounding properties, to show that it's of similar scale and height to the existing properties. Um, and if I run through the photo, so this is this is the plot behind this fence here uh, in this foreground uh, where the photo is. This is the main house access drive up the side to the plot at the at the rear where they stood. And this is the property off to the to the uh, south. If you look at it, so the development plot is off to the left of this picture at the bottom of the garden to trove view. Uh, and these are properties that are surrounding, which I'll, I'll, I'll maybe I'll come back to in a minute. Um, so in terms of the principle of development, that's acceptable. We're in the built up area boundary for Sidmouth. Uh, so you'll see the report goes through uh, some of the main issues in terms of the character and appearance. As you can see from the photos, there's a mix of design uh, and dwelling types here, semi-detached and detached. So the proposals, are, uh, different designs in the area, so the proposal is considered to accord with that and won't be out of character. You can see hopefully from this photo that the plot's got an unusually large uh, garden here. Uh, and in fact, only this property and the adjoining property have quite large gardens that might enable uh, this sort of backland development to happen. And it's considered that it can take place here without, without being cramped. 
Um, um, so no wider harm uh, visually uh, from the design or, or from the development. And in terms of the living conditions, uh, it's a five bed house. It, it will change the outlook uh, from some of the neighboring properties. Um, but I think it's far enough away from Brookfields here. It's quite a considerable distance down the bottom of the garden from Tro, uh, Troview, sorry. And then these properties here have got this garden to Brookfield between it and the development site. And then we've got two Brook Lane at the top. So if you imagine the development plot is in here and that other property is uh, over here. So again, we've got good distances to the boundaries and to the windows of all of the surrounding properties and to these neighbouring properties that are to the north. Um, so if I just go back to yeah, the elevation here, so you can see we've got a property here, but there's considerable distance to these windows and it's offset. These properties uh, are across the garden to this dwelling. Uh, again, considerable distance here. And we've got about 15 metres here with boundary planted in between. Uh, so again, uh, no harm to the amenity of those residents. And we've only got one high level obscure glazed window in this elevation. Uh, a relationship to this dwelling, but again, we've got considerable distance and it's offset and that dwelling has a large uh, garden area. And then again, minimal windows uh, facing the development plot. And in relation to these properties, it's on the other side of this, this large adjoining plot. So there's not considered to be any, any harm to the amenity of those neighbours or not to an extent uh, that we could justify refusal. With regard to flood risk, the site's in flood zone one, but is uh, on the EA maps at risk to, from surface water flooding. But in this case, the applicants uh, got done a, uh, a site-specific flood risk assessment for the site that draws on all the information that's available from the EA and from other development in the area. Um, and that's informed this flood risk assessment and the consultant has, has taken all that information, put it towards the environment agency who have said, given that detailed information, they're satisfied that the risk to this site is very low. Uh, from surface water flooding. So the equivalent equivalent to being in flood zone one, because of that, the environment agency is supportive of the application and we don't need to undergo uh, the sequential test. Uh, but obviously the applicant will need to go through uh, building control measures to ensure that they get suitable uh, surface water drainage. And we've also got a condition on there to be precautionary uh, about, uh, about that to make sure uh, we, we get the right details. Uh, with regard to the access, there's an existing access uh, off the road. Uh, it will be slightly widened at the entrance and then to enable this uh, plot to be served off it. And both properties will remain, it will, will have two parking spaces and there's adequate visibility uh, at the entrance here, uh, the satisfied Devon County, uh, that there's no highway concerns or objections. So in summary, the principle is acceptable. The design is considered to be acceptable. There'll be a change in the outlook for some of those residents, but it's not harmful. There'll be no overlooking or detrimental impact. Uh, so in light of that, the application's recommended for approval. Thank you. Thank you. Right, uh, Andrew Paley, welcome to the meeting. Um, you have three minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. That's brilliant. Um, well, thank you, Chair and members of the committee, uh, for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'd like to begin with by saying we've not lobbied anybody on part of this. Um, we've taken the application forward through an extensive dialogue with the officers. Um, as Mr Rose has said, it's within the built up area. We've spent time with Devon County to, to, to show them the access is suitable and access safe. We've spent a lot of time with the Environment Agency and Devon County Local Lead Flood Authority to confirm that the site is dry. Um, and it's been to the town council twice and on both occasions they've recommended approval. Um, we've taken great care to design this. Obviously we live in Trowview, it's our home, so we need to make sure it doesn't affect our, our living environments, but also of our neighbours. Um, and so we've looked at this very carefully to ensure that we have sufficient distances. And interestingly, the new plot, if it's approved, will have a larger rear garden than every house in the locality, apart from the house to the north, which is Perfect Cottage. Uh, who I do understand from the conversation with the residents, they want to put, um, to put, put the dwelling in their own back garden. Um, we looked at all the distances and made sure there's no windows to have a look at them, so the house is, is private, but also to maintain the privacy of our surrounding residents and, and neighbours. Um, and therefore, we're here to ask, answer any questions you may have, uh, but we feel that we've got to the point working with your officers carefully that we've got to the point where actually 
this can work comfortably and add another home to the existing built up area of Sidford and its sustainable settlement. Um, but if you have any further questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Paley. <clears throat> um, next, we have the ward member, Councillor Rickson. Dear me. Um, good afternoon. I, I would just like to um, come back on the comment from Mr. Paley. He said Purbeck Cottage, uh, Cottage has an application. In fact, this was some years ago and it was refused on flood risk and highways access reasons, I believe. My comments on this particular application are that only this week, residents in Sid Ford, including Two Bridges Road, received a letter from the Environment Agency, a copy of which I sent to the committee yesterday. This clearly states the village of Sid Ford is vulnerable to flash flooding. We live in a river valley with one of the shortest rivers in the country. Water levels can rise very quickly, particularly when combined with an incoming tide, which holds the water back. This happened on the 7th of July, 2012, when a flood warning was issued by the Environment Agency. At the height of the storm, all roads were impassable, including Two Bridges Road, and the river level through the ford in Sidmouth topped two metres when it is normally only a few metres deep. River banks were overtopped at Sidbury, Sidford and Sidmouth, and a chunk of garden in Brook Close was washed away by the force of the water down the Sidford stream into the River Sid. Please note the confluence of the River Sid, Sidford stream and Snod Brook mentioned in the Environment Agency letter are just downstream of this proposed development. And they, uh, the confluence is at Packhorse Bridge on the A3052. I would ask you to note there were four flood warnings at Sidford in 2012, including the incident on the 7th of July. No one knows when the next flood warning will occur in this area, but we all know it will happen. Thankfully, this year I've only received flood alerts, six in total to date. Turning now to the impact on neighbouring properties, the proposed large five bed property will affect the amenity of neighbouring properties. Mrs Longstaff at Purbeck Cottage, because this building will result in overshadowing for a substantial part of the day, as this large dwelling will be due south and close to the boundary of her property. She is concerned about overlooking and loss of privacy. Similarly, Mrs. Weber in Brook Lane will be affected due to the proximity of the proposed dwelling, which will result in overlooking and invasion of privacy. I believe the bedroom overlooking Brook Lane is to have an obscured window. This in itself is an acknowledgement that there is an overlooking and privacy issue here. However, I would suggest that anyone buying this property could replace this obscured glass with transparent glass. Clearly this proposed solution is not a solution at all. I hope the committee will recommend refusal, but if the committee is minded to grant planning permission at all, I would suggest it should be for a bungalow. This would eliminate some of the problems, namely overlooking, loss of privacy and shading, but will still result in another dwelling in an area acknowledged by the Environment Agency to be at risk of flash flooding. Thank you, Councillor Rickson. <clears throat> Mr Rose, do you have any comments to make regarding the issue of, um, of flooding, flash flooding? Um, yes, thank you, Chair. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, well, start off with, I think we all think it's, it's, it's it's, it's good and right that the EA send out the letters to the communities as a whole when there's a, uh, when there's a risk to the area from flash flooding. It doesn't mean there's yeah. a risk to each of those individual properties they write to. It's that, that in that area, there could be a risk of flash flooding and that people should be respectful of their neighbours and do, do what they can. Yeah. Uh, but it, in, in this case, the applicant has been through a site-specific flood risk assessment. So it's taken all the information that's available in the Oakle area about levels, flooding, routes, uh, soil, drainage, etc., and spoken to the Environment Agency about all of those details. And the Environment Agency have agreed with that information that's been submitted to show that this plot this development plot itself isn't at risk of that surface water flooding. Um, so yes, the wider area is, and I'm happy the Environment Agency being proactive in sending out those letters, but the applicants done site specific work here with the Environment Agency who, who are, are satisfied that the site is suitable for development. Thank you very much, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, right, and now I've got, um, Councillor Gazard, is that an old hander? 
been up a while. Yes, it is. Do apologise, Chair. OK. Right. Uh, Councillor Skinner. Yeah, I'm going to be fairly brief, really. I don't see any reasons to refuse this application. I'm going to go with the recommendation of approval and with the recommendations that have been put forward on the papers going forward. And I no need to add no more to that. Thank you very much. Right, right. so you're making happy, that happy proposal, second. yeah? Yes, I am. Recommendation Seconded from the of officer's recommendation. Councillor yeah. Serum. Second yeah. by Councillor the Serum. Yeah. Happy to second me, recommend them um, uh, on the basis there are good distance to the boundaries. The, the town council is, is satisfied with it and there are sufficient distances between all the properties and there'll be no harm to the immunity of the neighbours as, we, as we've heard. Uh, there's no risk of surface flooding. So it, it, it is a suitable development in that particular location, I would argue, along with Councillor Skinner. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Davy. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, yeah, um, I take Councillor Rickson's uh, points on board, but um, I, I think as they've done a very thorough flood risk assessment um, and there's no objection, um, you know, it's not actually in a flood zone, then I, I think we'd be on unsafe ground to refuse it on those grounds. She also raised the point about the obscure glass window, but if you look at condition eight, um, it says that the... Um, I take it this is the one we're looking at, the bathroom on the north elevation being glazed with obscure glass and that this is retained at all times. And I'm sure the neighbour would be very vigilant if any future occupier attempted to uh, change that um, and might also uh, notify future applicants to look out for any attempt to change that. Um, so um, on those grounds, I, I don't see any particular reason to object to this, although it had to seem a very large house to put here. And I always wonder why, who wants these five bedroom houses and, and how many people it's going to cram in. But that's not for me to decide. Thank you. Um, over to Mrs Shaw then, please. Thank you, Chair. Yes, members, there's two limbs to your recommendation. Um, that the habitat regulations appropriate assessment outlined in the committee be, report be adopted and the recommendation that the application be approved. Please, when your name is called, will you indicate whether you support the motion to recommend approval, you're against the motion to recommend approval or whether you're abstaining from the vote. Thank you. Councillor Bloxham. Support approval. Councillor Brown. Support approval. Councillor Chamberlain. Support approval. Councillor Davy. Support approval. Councillor De Serum. Support the motion to a uh, recommendation to approve um, with along with the habitat regulations and the other uh, regulations as listed in the application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Gazard. Support. Councillor Key. Approve. Councillor Lawrence. Support approval. Councillor Pook. Support approval. Councillor Pratt. Support approval. Councillor Skinner. Support approval. Councillor Woodward. Oh, Councillor Woodward, he's left, hasn't he? Uh, and Councillor Rag. Support approval. Thank you. I can advise the application is recommended for approval. Thank you, Wendy. Right, then we move on to agenda item 10 next. Application 210954 full. It's a minor application 20 um, for 61 Genwood Road, Dunkerswell, pages 43 to 50. Um, and I'd like to welcome Richard Jones, uh, the applicant to the meeting. Um, Mr. Jones, you'll have three minutes to speak. Um, so it's over to Chris Rose now to present his report. Chris. Thank you, Chair. So, yeah, 61 Genwood Road in Dunkerswell. Um, sorry, this isn't that clear, but this is the, the residential property here, and this is the garage and parking court it relates to. So we've got an application that's been submitted for change of use and alterations to a detached double garage to create an annex uh, for use by the applicant's family. 
Um, so I don't, I don't, I, should, I don't need to advise members that uh, to be an annex, there has to be a reliance on the main house. So there has to be independence, uh, interdependence, daily use between uh, the property and the house. That's usually by uh, sharing meals, going, um, uh, you know, maybe living in the main house and having this as separate accommodation. But there has to be that reliance on the main property for it to be an annex. Uh, now, this application is before committee because it's got uh, ward member support. And if I just run through the plans, so we've got the main applicants, uh, we've got the main applicants uh, property here and at the rear, there's this little parking court and within the parking court, uh, there's a garage and it's this garage that they want to that they want to use. So you can see here main property, garage and a small area that could become a garden. Uh, these are the existing elevations of the garage um, and then the proposed. So basically garage doors removed and windows put in. And then you can see the layout of the of the garage there. And in terms of the photos, we've got the property property to the left. And then we've got the garage down here in the in the parking court. And there's the photo of that with a small area to the side that could be used as a as a garden. Um, so the Highfield Estate in Dunkers Wells in the AOMB, there's no built up area boundary for Dunkers Wells. So technically it's in the countryside uh, and new residential dwellings aren't supported there in terms of uh, it being an unsustainable location without uh, the range of services and facilities. Um, as I say, there's a garage in the, the parking court at the moment. It's a short distance from the home. Uh, and as I'm, I'm sure Mr. Jones will explain, this is for his uh, partly for his family and for his daughters to move into. They share accommodation in his property at the moment and are having problems being able to move out and afford rental accommodation. Um, the, the unit itself is only 24 square metres. So there's a bed sitting room and a kitchen uh, and a shower room. This doesn't meet the national space standards, minimum space standards for a, a separate dwelling. Um, garage doors would be replaced uh, and as I say there's a small uh, outdoor amenity area. So the issue you see here in the report is the applicants applied for an annex so that as I say that would be interdependence and dependence on the main house um, otherwise it would be classed as a new dwelling but the details in the application uh, don't explain any link to the main house in fact Mr Jones has explained that this in effect will be accommodation for one of his daughters to live in uh, so it will be self-contained accommodation. Uh, such accommodation can't be applied for uh, as part of a householder application for an annex. Uh, so in effect, what is being applied for from the information we have it isn't an annex. It's a separate dwelling uh, to be going in this garage court. Um, and uh, the issue we have here is, as Mr. Jones has explained, that this will be for one of his daughters and there won't be any relationship to the main house other than you would normally have from people visiting their parents. Um, then we can't deal with the application uh, in, in this way. We can't grant it as an annex because that's not what we've been told the attended use is going to be. In terms of the character, um, this is the other issue. It's a very small unit, as you can see. It's not a high standard of amenity space sought from the MPPF. It's smaller than the surrounding dwellings. It's out of character. And as I say, the small size of it wouldn't meet the uh, national space standards um, quite a way under that at 24 square metres. So in light of that, it's considered to be contrary to the, to the local plan. Um, so as I say, an annex has been applied for, but it's not an annex that uh, I think Mr. Jones is seeking. It's a separate dwelling. Um, we can't deal with that under this uh, application and we've got concerns uh, about the unsustainable location for a dwelling and the poor living environment. So due to that, we're recommending refusal. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, right, Mr. Jones, uh, you have three minutes. Hey. Good afternoon. Um, we'd like to address some of the matters raised in the planning department submission. We throughout the process agreed to all the requests from the planning department from the withdrawal of the original application at the end of the consultation process due to it being on the wrong form, the rewording of the new application as per their suggestion and agreeing to the section 106. If the dependency on the main house is an issue, we would further be willing to remove the small kitchen and this has not been mentioned before. The garage was built as part of the original Gemwood Road development of one and two bedroom properties, so is in, in character with the surrounding properties, the majority of which are bungalows, including the one bedroom next door to the garage, and can be seen in the photograph on the screen. It's been 
purposely designed not to change the view from the street. Uh, the garage is a little over 12 metres from our property on a shared drive, also used to access the front doors of 63 and 76 and our own rear door. The amenity space outside is comparable with, to small properties on large developments such as Cranbrook and access still to the garden of the main house. Uh, we believe that paragraph 127F of the MPPF, when read in its entirety, can be used to support the application and the neighbourhood plan policy BE1 also has nothing that prevents the application as the building is already built. The size of the finished unit complies, we believe, if used as an annex, with all regulations, and although it may appear small at 24 square metres, it would be approximately 25% smaller than the adjacent bungalow and larger than less than five metres square of the current single room in the house. There have been no objections from the neighbours. It doesn't affect the trees, the landscape, the AOMD or the parking. Support our children up to aspire to owning their own property and this would allow them to save a deposit to do so while affording a young couple some privacy in their relationship. It would also provide us with a downstairs WC allowing my elderly parent to visit as this is something that we don't have in our main house and they do not live locally. We have lived at 61 Genwood Road for over 27 years with all four members of our family having our employment in or based at Dunkerswell. I'm happy to answer any further questions and thank you for your time. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Jones. Um, right, we go to the ward members now, uh, both the committee members, so you have as long as you like. Um, Councillor Brown. I think uh, Councillor Key should go first because he's the one supporting this application. Well, you were first on my list. Yeah. So, all right, Councillor Key. Right. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I mean, this is um, uh, um, really, uh, it's very, very sad that these youngsters cannot afford to actually get on the uh, housing ladder. Um, I, I did hear from Mr. Jones in actual fact that it, something is a little uh, different to what is actually been applied for, and that would be to actually have that as a bedroom uh, with a shower and the uh, reliant on the house. Mr. Rose, what would be the um, view if that was to happen, just as a bedroom and a shower uh, or, you know, washing facilities alone. Yes, Councillor Key. So if, if Mr. Jones is saying that there will now be uh, that interdependence, that relationship between this garage and the house, um, and that, that, you know, that, that area gets removed and he's subject to enter into a legal agreement to prevent the unit being used as uh, a self-contained property, then the proposal would be acceptable. Uh, the, the reason it's come forward to you for refusal is because up to now, the information that we've received from Mr. Jones is that, or and quoted in the report, is that there won't be that dependency on the main house. Um, but if, if, that, if there is that dependency on the main house, then, then yes, it, we, we, we could potentially support it as a, you know, sort of annex accommodation, but that, that's not what we've been told up to now. No, no, this, this is unfortunate because really we have to deal with what this application is applying for now and not yeah. what is, is yeah. going to be put forward. Um, this is the first application, I think, isn't it? So uh, it would be possible for the applicant to come forward with on a free go. Would that be correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay, fine. Um, I, I mean, this, this is what uh, I felt all along. I mean, it's very, very um, difficult to actually fit a bedroom and uh, uh, kitchen as well as sort of like uh, um, hygiene facilities in there, uh, really. Um, but uh, I can quite see what Mr. Jones is wanting, something for uh, his family. Um, it's, and in my opinion, it's not an annex because an annex really, I consider more or less sort of joining the house. But um, so really what we've got to deal with, we've actually got to deal with what we've got in front of us today, which 
uh, wants that facility, which is not really um, what Mr. Jones is prepared to accept. So uh, before I propose anything, I'll let um, Councillor Brown just have a, a word. Councillor Brown. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, yeah, I mean, if this unit was for accommodation only, without the facilities of, of cooking or a kitchen, um, it could be supported because then it's dependent on the main house. And um, what they do in a lot of London boroughs and Essex boroughs is if someone wants auxiliary accommodation like this, they make sure there's no kitchen involved in it. Um, and we should do the same thing um, if it's for additional accommodation. So with just um, uh, living accommodation in there, I would support the application, but I find it very, very difficult to support in its present form. Thank you. Um, are either of you making a proposal? Yes, and, and unfortunately, I think I'm going to have to go with what we've got in front of us now, but I do hope that Mr Jones comes forward um, <laughs> with a free go, stating what he has actually described. We can't deal with that in, uh, now because that's not actually in front of us. That's only no. proposals. So, um, I'm, unfortunately, I'm going to have to go with what the recommendation is and hope Mr Jones will come back with what we've actually suggested and which will be favourably looked at. Thank you, Councillor Key. That makes perfect sense. Um, is there a seconder? Yeah. Yes, I'll um, second. <laughs> well, well, you, you've got two there, um, yeah. yeah, don't fight. Please I'll don't second. fight. I'm a chair, not a referee. <laughs> <laughs> right, who seconded then? Skinner. Councillor Skinner, would you like to speak? Yes, I would. And I, and I think the whole dilemma is quite simple, really. Um, I'm actually very, very supportive of um, the applicant in having accommodation for his family and moving into that particular accommodation. Um, and if it could be tied in some way to the house, I don't have any problem with youngsters going in and, 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 a, and a kickboard, a starting board for them to start in life. But the dilemma we have in planning terms is that, of course, what could happen and does happen subsequently is the family may sell up and move out. And this is something where, where it could be. And then that could be a dwelling that could be sold off separately. And it may be the family don't move out and they just want to sell the, the, the thing off separately because and not because anybody's trying to pull wool over anybody's eyes, but because circumstances change and evolve. So from a planning perspective. It is absolutely right that we refuse this application on the basis as the officers have, have suggested, which is why, Madam Chair, I want to support and uh, supporting the way that Councillor Key uh, is opposing this application, or sorry, supporting the recommendation put by the officers. But I really do hope that um, the applicant takes heart of where we sit as a committee and that if he were to make sure that this was an annex to the existing dwelling and not a separate dwelling, and that's the crux of the issue, then I feel it would get much support from all members. But as it sits at the moment as a separate dwelling with the application that's in front of us, I'm afraid it's not something we can, can support. Thank you. No, and, and the points that have been raised are not material planning considerations either, you know, with families and so on. Councillor Gazard, do you have anything to add to that? No, Chair, I think Councillor Skinner has said what I was going to say. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Davey? Uh, yeah, I'd just like uh, to check with Mr Rose that um, we can, if it came back again without the kitchen, um, Mr Rose has expressed some concern that it's such a separate building that it might be difficult to condition dependence. Uh, can I just check that we would be able to condition dependence on the main building in that circumstance? Otherwise, somebody could add uh, a small kitchen um, and, um, as Councillor Skinner has pointed out, and it, it then become a separate dwelling. So I just want to make sure we can make sure that that is conditioned before the applicants come back again. Right. Mr Rose. 
Yes, thank you. Yeah, it is unusual that it's detached and so far away. And we, we have uh, previously in these circumstances, and in fact, the applicants mentioned it in one of their statements, uh, we can secure that. We could secure that in this case by a legal agreement. And that legal agreement could then also ensure that, uh, you know, they don't use it uh, independently of the, of the main house. So uh, it will probably be through a very short legal agreement in this case, but we can control it. Right. Thank you. Um Councillor Key, you want to come back? You're muted. Won't come up. All right. Right. I'm, I'm unmuted now. Yes. Uh, no, I've nothing. For, oh, I was just going to um, uh, say the same to. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Um, Rose, in actual fact, because I mean, at the present, the garages would be tied to the house anyway, because they belong to the uh, same owner. So uh, hopefully that could be done exactly the same. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Key. Um, right over to Mrs. Shaw to sum up, please. Thank you, Chair. Yes, members, when your name is called, please would you indicate whether you're in support of the recommendation to refuse, whether you're against the recommendation to um, refuse, or whether you're abstaining from the vote. Thank you. Councillor Bloxham. Yes, support the recommendation to refuse. Councillor Brown. Councillor Brown, you're on mute at the moment. Sorry about that. Um, yes, yeah, support it in its present form, yes. Thank you. Councillor Chamberlain. Support motion to refuse. Councillor Davy. Support refusal. Councillor De Serum. Support recommendation to refuse. Councillor Cassard. Support refusal. Councillor Key. Refuse. Councillor Lawrence. Support recommendation. Councillor Pook. Support refusal. Councillor Pratt. Support refusal. Thank you. Councillor Skinner. Support refusal. And Councillor Rag. Support refusal. Thank you. So that's recommended for refusal. Thank you. Uh, that brings our meeting to an end. I'd like to thank everybody, members, officers, um, and any members of the public watching online or taking part. Um, can I just remind all those present that the supporting officer will confirm when the meeting is no longer being recorded or going live. Until then, your comments will be live to the public. Um, thank, thank you, members. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair.